right, everyone, it's episode 147 of the Warhammer 40,000 podcast, known across the internet and around the bloody world as Look Out Sir. Phil, was it okay that I said bloody? I feel like that's an okay, appropriate, almost swear. I, I'm sure that's fine. Yeah. We're going to let that one fly? All right, good. My name's Dan. How you doing, Phil? Yes, my my name is Phil. I'm here. I'm alive once again in the freezing cold shed. Uh, so I'm wrapped up with my woolly hat on and my, my weird granddad Cardi. Uh, you know what I'm gonna give to you, Phil? In uh, amongst my possessions, I have a oil heater. One of those oily heater things that you can uh, do, move do, around. Do, do you know what? I've had two of them in the past, and I've returned them both because they're rubbish. They don't do the um, job. No, they don't do anything. Like they're they're not even warm to the touch, or at least well, the one I have, the ones I've got. The one I have is is tickety boo. Does the job oh. perfectly. When my okay. heating stopped working over the winters, which we're still very much in, came in well, Andy. Oh, well, clearly I've just had either two duff ones, or I maybe I bought the same make twice and completely forgot. That's what um, it'll be. Yeah, you gave in to some weird hipster brand, no doubt. Uh, no, it was whatever seemed half decent on Amazon, or oh, I, no, I think I might have got one from up the road as well, or like a home base or something, and returned it. I'm sure everyone's uh, finding this riveting, my friend. We're going to move uh, on from your purchase. Swiftly, habits. swiftly, yes, indeed. Get away, reverse out of this cul-de-sac of despair <laughs> into Warhammer Forty Thousand related things. Exactly. Uh, There's nothing worse than a podcast that doesn't start with 40k content. So I, I apologise, everyone. Yeah, exactly. Get 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 in your lane, mate. Anyway, right. What are we talking about? We were going to talk about arcs of moment. We were going to talk about boarding actions. We were going to talk about all those things and more. Unfortunately, Element Games let us down, didn't they, Phil? Uh, yes. Well, I believe uh, Games Workshop let them down, and they didn't get, uh, receive enough copies for everyone, and there's still stock and supply issues. Uh, so we didn't get sent our copy. Two weeks ago now. Um, yep. it? Yeah, two weeks ago. Long should have got it. Now. Should have re-got it last weekend. That didn't happen. It, it estimates we'll get it this week. I doubt it. Uh, and when I was up at Warhammer World last uh, weekend, they didn't have any there either. So it's a rare nugget of a thing to find. Because obviously, boarding actions is that popular. Absolutely. Almost as popular as a five-star review. Come on now, Timmy. You've got your orders. You've got to do it. Uh, uh, but, I, but I don't want to, sir. You've got your orders. Now get up there, get over that trench, and get me that five-star review, and get it back here right away. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, are we actually going to talk about what we are talking about this week? We'll do it in the first <laughs> I realised, I was like, oh, okay. I was so excited about the fact that you sort of set up the perfect segue into a five-star review. I was like, well, I'm just, I just go with it. Anyway, so we're not talking about that stuff. We're going to talk about nothing in particular. Phil went to a Crusade event. We'll talk about that. We're going to an AOS event uh, this weekend while this podcast is out there in the world. So we'll talk about that. Um, and we're going to do a general topic about... Um, what is the general topic, Phil? You, you, you came up with it, didn't you? Oh, it was uh, a debate about whether Games Workshop is the best it's ever been or possibly the worst it's ever been. There and, you go. Uh, we're going to get into the nitty-gritty and work out which it is. Exactly. Comprehensively. There is no way anyone on the internet could in any way disagree with our position. Ex- exactly. And there's no m- polite middle ground. We have to go hard to... Yes or no, basically. And we're going to pose the argument from opposing perspectives. Are you going to be for and against on one topic and me the other? Uh, possibly. I think naturally we probably would do anyway. So That's we'll see true. how that it goes. I don't want to rig it in any way. I want natural No, all right, we're going to go with it. Opinions. What if we just agree straight away? Well, then we're then no, I'll still sure. come up with opposing arguments. There you go. All right, fine. I understand. Good good work. Anyway, right. Um, yes, this is how it goes. And also because we are so busy at the moment getting everything ready for this AOS weekend, Phil having already been to a warm event, world event, me having gone to an RTT in Bournemouth last weekend. Basically, between work, building an AOS army, and other lifely things, 
uh, we've, which is crazy. So we're just doing this in a one and we're going to see how it goes. And, um, and yeah, so it might be a shorter episode. I don't know what a shorter episode looks like for us, but I guess you'll find out soon. Still be three hours. Well, maybe. We'll see how it goes. Anyway, Phil, where's this five-star review come from? Um, Apple Podcasts of America. Bang on, Phil. A broken clock is right twice a day. Uh, unless, of course, it's a digital clock, in which case only once a day, I suppose. Although maybe not ever. Depends, I suppose, if it flashes zeros or eights. Or it might might just not display anything because it's properly That's broken. True. That's true. But if it was flashing zeros, it could be right at midnight, I suppose. But true. it would flash eights, wouldn't it? Mm, I mean, depends on the type, maybe. Yeah, anyway, yeah, this isn't forty k. Let's get on with the <laughs> review. <laughs> you, oh, and oh, by the way, sorry, I forgot the spiel. If you want to leave us a five star review and be like this individual that we haven't named yet, uh, do so because you know you'll be part of the greatest podcast across the internet. Uh, bar none. Uh, and then in addition to that, we have a patron. Thank you so much to our patrons. We love you dearly. Smooch, smooch, smooch. The microphone won't have picked that up. Did it pick it up, Phil? Did you hear the, the smacky? Oh, I, I did indeed. I did indeed. Oh, okay, yeah. there we go. Lovely stuff. Do you want to reciprocate, make any similar kind of gestures and noises? Uh, I'll, I'll just say a polite thank you very much. I'm sure they don't want my air kisses thrown into their ear holes. No, that's fine. That's fine. Just mine, apparently. Exactly. Um, anyway, there you go. And uh, there's merchandise. Uh, be cool and original. Buy some of our merchandise because no one else is. So you'll never run the risk of being. Uh, be- you'll be that one person in the room. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That one guy. Or in the country. Beautiful fit, maybe. though. Beautiful fit. It's lovely, 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 high quality materials. Um, that'll do. All right. Let's get on with it. We have the review of You Got Purdy Mouths five stars by way of Super Brett-tastic via Apple Podcasts of the United States. We do well, Phil, in the United States of America. That we do. There you go. You Got Purdy Mouths five stars. Funny, insightful and time-killing podcast. How much more do you need in a 40k podcast? Question mark, exclamation mark, question mark, exclamation mark, question mark, exclamation mark, question mark, exclamation mark, question mark. (gasps) And they talk real purdy-like. That was it. That was the five-star review by way of Super Brett-tastic. Thank you, Super Brett-tastic. You are an incredible human being. A round of applause. (laughs) Much obliged. Phil, please expand upon this and we'll get on with the show. Uh, well, thank you very much, Brett. I assume that's your name, Mr. Brett Tastic. Uh, thank you very much for your review, succinct. I mean, I don't think we sound particularly purdy, but I'll take it. So, uh, thank you very much. Oh, um, am I meant to say more? Um, I don't know. It just seemed like it just seemed like such an abrupt end. All right, fine. There you go. Let's get <laughs> on with the show. Thanks very much, everyone. Five star reviews, patron merchandise. We're out of here. Transitional noise. All right, then. Here we go. The podcast. What we're going to do first, we're going to talk about Phil's crusade event. Because Phil went to Warhammer World, didn't you, Phil? Didn't you, Phil? Didn't you, Phil? I did. Me and Richie, uh, who had been... Quizmaster extraordinaire. Is he going to be angry that we didn't invite him on to do this segment? Um, probably not because he's too busy painting up his old, um, chaos army for the AOS event. Exactly. So he, he doesn't have time. So he hasn't not got that luxury to uh, do it because he basically started painting his whole army bar the slap shop undercoat. Um, basically at the beginning of this week, week. Yeah. So he's amazing. Amazing. He's, he's basically had like f- three or four nights in which to do it because obviously He's got a, he, he's got a job that he's got to do in the daytime, so he's not got any free time to spare. Well, there you go. What about all that free time he had before the job kicked in? I mean, I, he has had a few months where he could have done it. Yeah, but that's on. To him. be fair, though, he, his army only actually came out relatively late. Yes, because so he was um, going to do Silvermeth, and then he uh, changed his mind to do Chaos when the new Chaos uh, box set came out. So, yeah, relatively new. Let's oh, be generous. Yeah. So you and Richie, you went up to Warhammer World. Did you drive, Phil? 
Uh, I'm a, not a driver, so I, I um, did not do the driving duties. So R- Richie got to show for you this time. <laughs> yes. He, 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 How does his he, driving compare to mine? Is it a better drive, a better journey or a worse journey? I won't be jealous. Do, do, do you know what? I, I've never really gone eat the, oh, yeah, this is a better drive than Dan's or Richard's. I think you're equally as competent uh, a driver as uh, the other person uh, Richard's got some good jukebox, uh, you know, uh, he, he likes his, his synth wave music, which I quite enjoy too, uh, whereas you do tend to do sort of more random, like, p- punk, emo, I want to say emo ska music, like, you've got a bit more of an eclectic taste, let's say. That's true, that's true. I'm more of a, uh, more of a, more of a dweeb. M- maybe. Or less of one, maybe. <laughs> Mate, I don't know. Anyway, say, that isn't forty k. So I went up to yes. Wyoming World. We did That's the, not even the Crusade Sigma. event. Um, that was it. So you went up there. You stay at the Holiday Inn again? Uh, no, we did Premier in this time because <gasps> apparently it was Premier cheaper. Inn. We got a whole bar of chocolate on our beds. Uh, was it with not our personalized names. with your names? Oh my god! There yes, you it go. printed oh. out, stuck on. Uh, what more could you want? Um, Mate, that's pretty incredible. That's top shelf. Why aren't we staying at the Premier Inn uh, this uh, upcoming weekend? Well, well, I'll tell you what. So I, I had a curtain that was rigged to collapse on me the moment I touched it and had to reassemble it every morning or evening uh, to, to make it work. Um, so I, I kind of think Holiday Inn actually is a better quality. Even Go with what more. you know in it, the exactly. tried and true Holiday Inn of Nottingham. Yep. Yeah, so, so you got up there. Never had a bad time. It's always been a good experience. No, exactly. Uh, got up there Friday. Didn't have time to uh, actually play a game like a test game of Royal Army. So we just had. A, we milled around a bit um, at Warhammer World for a little bit. Matt with Sean, who's the unheard of member of a Lookout Sir crew because he's yet to appear on the show, except for one time he did a question at the end of the year quiz. I think he did, yeah. Last and he year. did such a terrible job of it. That's why he's never coming on. Oh, it's a shame. No, I love him. I'd love him to come on, but he's, you know, he's got the personality of a painting <laughs> of a doorknob. <laughs> That's so mean. That's so no, mean. I know I'm being mean. I um, love him. That's the thing. He's like, he's, he's, I've known him longer than I've known you. He's, he's, I, know. I, I think I've been friends with him since 2003. So, wow. like, yeah, God, it's we go way times. back. Long times. I know, I know, 20 um, years, actually. It's coming up to our anniversary. Mm. I have to give him a big kiss when I see him. Lovely. Anyway, so anyway, long story short, you got there, you didn't play the games on the thing, but you played Crusade. So what was the theme of Crusade? When I went, it were Necrons, and that was the whole idea. We were exploring tomb worlds. What was it this time? Uh, so this was part two of that campaign, the Rising Tomb oh my campaign. God. So uh, uh, they did a brief spiel at the beginning to catch people up, and we had like an event pack which explained a little bit. So at the end of the last campaign, the um, the planet's surface was uh, bombarded from orbit. Everything was destroyed. Everyone teleported, I believe, down to the vaults underground. So now we are ex. Uh, exploring the uh, the vaults underground of this uh, planet or I believe across multiple tomb worlds and you're going through trans-dimensional portals so you're kind of all over the place in this kind of labyrinth uh complex and you're effectively just trying to escape I think um, the way the points worked and the way uh, the, sort of the campaign system worked it was a bit nebulous that wasn't too well explained but it was still using the system from White Dwarf, which was similar to the first uh, one, so you would have been a bit familiar with it. Um, in the first one, I believe, you had tiles, and you, as you explored them, you could flip them over, and there'd be something on the other side, and you'd have radiation and stuff affecting you. This time, uh, every tile, so it was like a... I want to say it was like a f- five or six by four grid, or six by five something like that each tile was representing a corridor so it was either a straight line like an l shape or a like a a t-junction or a a cross crossroads Uh, all the tiles were laid out like that but in a jumble so you and you could only go to the next tile if the corridors lined up and i think when you won games uh you could uh turn the tile around and then move your team so we split up into four teams there was the uh invaders defilers 
explorers and researchers uh i got put on the defiler team because uh richie suggested that we team up together and that we'd be on the same team so we don't actually accidentally play each other uh so we did that uh lo and behold uh, the defilers from the last one were the losing team and that the point system was rolling across from the last one so uh, the winner of this event would be the combined winner from uh of scores from both so we were already starting in fourth place uh, which was a little disappointing but i was like okay apparently we were only a couple of points behind uh so it, and it was all very close apparently um at the beginning of each mission we had a, a team leader who gave us a debriefing or briefing uh one person was elected to be the cartographer who'd be the person that would rotate the tiles around our uh, where we were on the map and there were two champions uh and they just needed to win their games and i presume them winning their games contributed to how we moved around on the map that wasn't mm. very well explained so i wasn't really sure and then the rest of us were just playing games whether our wins actually counted or contributed to anything i've got no idea that also wasn't very well explained so 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 yeah so when we did it the champions were definitely in effect so you always had a champion thing and and much like you that was not explained right it was just so there was an implication that it was more important that you won Yes. But it wasn't really clear why or what was happening. So just so I'm clear, so obviously we went through it in relative detail. We understood the the premise of it based on what I'd experienced. One of the things I flagged, I think, before, and again, I, I, I probably should have gone back and listened to this, but I haven't had time. But the, the thing I think I definitely felt at the time was it could have been good if we had gotten some earlier notification of some of the systems that we were going to be encountering, right? Like, what could we have not had early access to things did they do anything this time to try and help that or did you just turn up on the day and get a binder thrown at you again? yeah well we had an email or about a week before or a good few days before and it basically gave us a rundown of all the teams uh that there were and it was sort of like when you come pick a team um if you had done the event before you can be on the same team and it just a little narrative bit of of what the teams would were doing and also what their state of play was in terms of uh the defilers basically because they did badly in the last one their war band was effectively scattered and in hiding and, and running away so i was like well that one sounds a bit rubbish uh, and that's the one i ironically ended up on uh but i think you know for my minor tools that i was taking defilers and invaders seemed the two more appropriate teams uh than researchers and explorers so i, I wasn't too you know, it was fine, basically. And, and um, so you and then started we got in another... this. Lo- you started in this losing position. Did they give any indication as towards any mechanics or things that they were going to attempt to do to, you know, to correct that balance? Was it that because you were starting in a weaker position, they've done things to kind of mix it up? I mean, it seems like a really odd design decision from a kind of gaming weekend perspective. Maybe not so much from a campaign perspective, but it does seem very odd from a weekend perspective, to end up in a scenario where you're turning up and basically being told, by the way, you're already on the back foot. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. I know. mean, so there, there were two things. And the first one, I wasn't sure if it was deliberate or not. Um, it sounded like when we were told to go to our tables, he was like, here's the range of table numbers that you're on, like 16 to 28 or something. He said, uh, I'm not allocating you your your tables. Have a look at the tables look at the terrain and just pick a table and everyone else in terms of the our opponents because basically you your team gets matched up with another team so two teams are always playing each other uh and you're just playing random opponents within that they were all given a table specifically so i think the implication was because we were behind we could pick our opponent but that in itself was quite confusing because we're rocking up to a table having only had a brief encounter with the rest of our teammates. So there's lots of people milling around tables. We're trying to find one that's either empty or only has one person on. And that person you've got to make sure isn't on your team already because you could only vaguely remember who they were. Um, So I had a little look around and I see uh, there's just one person at this table and it's a lovely squat army. The Votan are there. Uh, and I looked around and I was like, oh, this feels like the only table that's available. Okay, I'll just go here. Made sure he was on a different team. And that was my opponent for the first game. I assume the the implication was that we were meant to have a slight 
advantage by being able to pick our matchups. But that only really works if we were explicitly told that beforehand and we had a sort of discussion internally with our team like, oh, who would you like to be paired up with or what have you. So it, while that was meant to maybe be a boost, I'm not sure it was. Uh, later on, I think after game three maybe, we had an option to... Uh, basically, uh, we were... We did a challenge, I presume the leader, the Games Workshop employee he was running our team, uh, challenged the team in pole position, basically. So we got paired up with the number ones, effectively the team that's doing the best and arguably the better players, you could say. Uh, so we got t- paired up against them. And the idea was if we won more of our games, that we would effectively jump ahead in points and that would help us uh, go up the rankings. And I think after that one, we went from fourth place to third place. So <laughs> it, even though I, I sort of assumed the idea was that maybe we would jump all the way up to first place, but no, obviously that didn't happen. Um, so that was another mechanic. And then alluded to, but never seemingly interacted, was the guy... Um, the team leader sort of gave a vague illusion to the fact that um, if you're doing really well, uh, you'll be given a card at some point. Uh, and, you know, if you're canny or you're uh, a bit more subtle, he says, you won't get one. So I read it into it as if you say you're winning three games of three from the first day, you'll be given some kind of secret card, which will somehow maybe new to your or nerf your army, maybe to make it as a balancing mechanic for the people that are just winning all their games, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. That didn't happen to me. I, I don't know of anyone that got that. So maybe that was something that was alluded to, but never actually happened. Because uh, yeah, yeah. it is quite easy, I think, to game your crusade armies to be quite competitive, I think. So, and that was, I think, the one of the challenges of the of the weekend, potentially navigating around that. Uh, it's they the fatal flaw of the crusade system, isn't it? The the the, the amount of ability <laughs> to create disparity between uh, opposition and how yeah, they so use so CP to create balance. It yeah, just, and, and, it and I, I I spoke to you and both Richie beforehand to find out how people had built their armies before, because I didn't want to like completely tailor my army beforehand. And I, so basically, you can spend requisition points and give characters or units uh, relics or warlord traits and stuff like that. And I decided that I would give my captain a warlord trait to start off with, and that was it. And everything else I would sort of unlock as I progress. So once my captain went up a level after the first game, I then gave him a relic to make his weapon mastercrafted. And then um, as I went on and leveled him up more, he got more crusade relics um, and stuff like that uh, as I went Whereas I think, and whenever I had an option to like roll for a battle trait or pick one, I always rolled and just stuck with it. And I thought that would be mm. the sort of fairest option uh, and embrace that. And I think some people did. I think others just like picked obviously what they thought was the best or most interesting kind of combinations of uh, stuff um, for their army. So you could have um, uh, people that had like a, a much stronger army in effect. Um, so. Yeah, there wasn't any other like real balancing mechanics. There were some obviously random stuff that went along from games to games. Um, so first game was pretty standard in terms of no obscure uh, like mission rules. Second one was um, basically as we had moved around the map, there was some like special thing that we had stumbled upon. So there was a couple of mission uh, abilities that was affecting both mm. armies, which was, I think one of them was, if you're within nine inches, you get re-roll hit rolls and wound rolls of one uh, to the target that you're shooting at, which was very strong. Uh, me and my opponent in the second game completely forgot about it. Uh, yeah. You could also um, interact with some terrain, so you could do a free action that wasn't even action. You just look at a piece of terrain that you're next to, roll the dice on a six plus, uh, it something happens and you've got to go up to the TO and see what happens. And you could only do this once per person. Um, and my opponent did it. He rolled a six. So we go off. And basically that piece of train turns into a Necron piece of train, <gasps> which was very interesting, but didn't do anything else that game. And then when I came to do it, uh, well, no, because what happened is everyone was doing this and it would stay there for the next game. 
So it oh, would. Okay. It, so everybody's um, tables were slowly being like necronified, basically in in that oh, game. Oh, that's nice. Uh, which was a really nice feature, and the whole necron terrain thing, which I'll just explain up front uh, now, rather than going game by game. But it, that was a really cool feature that I really liked. Uh, and then, so I rolled for mine. I also rolled a six. So and I went up, and they said, "Oh no, it's only once per table." They were like, "We'd have loved to have done it uh, a bit more, but there just wasn't enough terrain to go around." So every table should in theory have a necron piece of terrain if you rolled for it and i think in the second ge- in the third game you could also do it as well oh no it was actually halfway through this game they said actually it happens on a five up now because i think they wanted to encourage more people to get the, the terrain on the on the table and then gotcha. in the game afterwards you could sort of again interact with that necron terrain uh and if you rolled like i think a five or, or four up no four up you could then roll on this table and the table would allow you to do something uh, but you discover what the terrain does. Uh, That's at least something. That sounds at least better than what I dealt with. They had nothing like that. That sounds cool. At least it's on theme, right? Yes. No, this bit like was all really cool. I think the the going around the map and stuff like that wasn't very interesting or, or well explained. Uh, and I had a vague recollection no, of how it works because I've got the White Dwarf article where these mechanics exist. And it wasn't an exact replica of the White Dwarf article. Um, cause the, uh, sort of mission mechanics that you stumble across were actually taken from the first, uh, White Dwarf, uh, campaign, mm. not the second one, uh, cause the second one has like this booby trap mechanic and that wasn't in here at all. So they, they had done, they had customized it, but I was, was predominantly the White Dwarf one. Uh, yeah, you could, uh, interact with the Necron train. I believe one of them allowed you to teleport a unit, uh, from that terrain piece anywhere else on the board, which is the one I rolled. Uh, another one, uh, I think maybe gave you like a feel no pain uh, type save, and then or a reanimations protocol type save, and then another one maybe gave you wounds back or an invun save. I can't quite remember what those two were because um, I never actually rolled for them. Oh, or actually, do I still have it here? Because I think I actually kept the sheet. Oh, I do. Yeah, look, well, you can see it. There's a there's a cool little sheet that appeared on everybody's uh, tables. Uh, oh yeah, you can regain uh, one lost wound in your command phase. Necron units regain two, or uh, reanimation protocols. Uh, so you use it in the end of shooting or combat. Roll a dice for each uh, slain model. On a six up, that uh, model is returned, excluding characters, monsters, and vehicles. And Necrons do it on a four plus if they want. So obviously on theme. So if you're taking a Necron army, uh, you're doing even better. And then that was on the third game. They repeated that in the fourth game. And then on the uh, fifth game, it was a bit like madness. Like This was a final hurrah of the missions. Uh, basically, after you deployed a unit, you had to roll a dice. And roll a one and two, nothing happened. And roll a three, or right. f- re- three to five, you suffered D3 mortal wounds plus one. So D3 plus one mortal wounds to that unit. Every time you deployed a unit, basically, uh, which was quite damaging. Uh, on on a six, you stop rolling, but that unit takes like it was something like d six plus three or d six plus something immortal wounds, and you had to go up and speak to a to. That never <laughs> happened to us, but it just meant everything that we deployed took at least a couple of mortal wounds. On yeah, well, yeah, not yeah, always. Yeah. Sometimes you rolled low and it was fine, but yeah, a couple of units like you know a few mod- few key models like my uh, uh, Gravis Inceptors, like one of those died because uh, it just took three mortal wounds. I was like, okay, great. Um, yeah, but apparently what happened is if you rolled a six, you would go up, you would lose that unit completely, and it would be replaced with a Necron unit. And you would then have a little data sheet that would tell you how the Necrons work, and you would have that, and you would control that for the rest of the game. That's kind of um, cool. Which was really cool. And I think, obviously, some one of the uh, guys was just donating his army for the purposes yeah, yeah, of yeah. the the uh weekend so that was a really cool ability i, really I, n- like I never that. saw it but saw um got told about it afterwards which i thought was really yeah, I like cool. that a lot that's that's the thing right that was what we were missing in the first one the first one was just so uninspiring in the way that they had done it like there was no effort to create anything other than just a bunch of generic games of 40k with a loose narrative told by people ultimately using a grid system and the implication of uh, vault keys and who knows what else was going on. It was very vague. Now, here's a question. Did the person leading your team 
know the scenarios, know what was going on and actually were they kind of helpful or was it... Because one of the things I found really weird when I did the the, the uh, Crusade event last year was like I found myself in a situation where I was basically paired up with a with a GW staff member who by his own admission had been brought in at the last minute and was basically told asked to help out and look, no disrespect to the guy himself I thought that was a you know really good of him to volunteer his time and all the rest of it so I never want to be unfair to him but at the same time I just always remember thinking well that was a bit crazy because it costs money for us all to be here you're telling me that with that money you couldn't have brought someone in in advance and have trained them on the scenarios and given them a character mm, and created I mean, some I c- uh, m- It might be, though, that someone was ill on the day and that's Possibly. why there was a dropout, which would the- sort of be understandable. I got the impression that wasn't the case in oh. this particular instance, but obviously that could be me being misinformed. But what I will <laughs> say is is that we we still got a good time out of him because, you know, I kind of poked him a bunch and said, <laughs> what's your character name? What your, have you come up with, like, who are you? What's the what's going on? Create something for okay. me. Okay. Uh, no, what, no one asked him what his character name was. Now, I believe, and I could be mistaken, that he was also a stand-in uh, and a replacement. But I, he actually did a really good job, I thought. He was a great, no, great. character. He all spoke to us like he was, as Richard described, a substitute teacher. He was Amazing. very, like, stern but humorous uh, with us all. Uh, nice. told us I off like if that. we lost our games uh but you know that's it was very what you encouraging. want there, right? you want that you want there to be you want that world building you want that little bit of interwoven kind of narrative with the gaming right you want to feel like this stuff matters but you also want to create that setting in your mind that you know you're you're fleeing you know through the catacombs of this tomb world and weird stuff is going on you know like you want to kind of feel connected to that narrative and i think that was their biggest failing in the first one that it literally was just five random crusade games all in and of themselves connected by the most obtuse the most vague like uh parameters as it were. yeah like our missions i thought were they were all custom uh, i thought they were all pretty interesting but the narrative of them was kind of like you're just fighting your your way out so the first one was uh cleanse the corridors uh, and it's like you're fighting through the tunnels. Second one was deliverance. So it's like, oh, you're exhausted, um, but you're still well because obviously you're fighting. But it's like uh, you're, you're finding supplies, but you're just ultimately fighting your opponent. The first, the third one was desperate raid. So again, you're fighting through the underground. Like there wasn't any like you're doing a, a raid to destroy some objectives or anything. The missions were all a bit straightforward. Uh, the fourth one was Sacred Ground, which was a bit more interesting from um, a sort of narrative story. But again, seizing territory, fighting. And then the last one was Ascension, which was the escaping one. And I thought it would be a bit more about like, oh, you've got to get to the other side of the, a table or something and escape off the board, because I knew that was one of the Crusade-specific missions. But no, this was more like you've got to hold the middle... Um, of the battlefield and you basically get uh, more points if your warlord's there at the end of the game and your warlord survived and you get more points for killing your, your opponent's warlord and stuff like that um but all the missions were uh, split up into two primary objectives the first one was take and hold so effectively hold hold one and more two or more or more than your opponent and then the second uh primary one was always something sort of mission specific which was a bit more unique and that was made it a bit more interesting. It was like, you know, oh, if you control these particular objectives that are uh, not in either person's deployment zone, at the end of your turn, you might score more points. Or if you hold one particular one that's active or something like that. So uh, the missions, the, the primary bit of, you know, take and hold, score one, two or three was a bit boring because it was the same thing every time. And weirdly, that felt a bit more, you know, uh, Grand Tournament-esque. Uh, okay. than, than the other more specific uh, sort of secondary ones which scored less but were sort of ultimately more interesting um, So, and uh, you know when we got the, to the second mission where we were given uh, this little uh, slip basically which was our action for interacting with the terrain that would then become a Necron terrain we were all given that from our um, team leader and we were like oh brilliant like we as a team 
have this sort of secret objective and then we get to our table and they've also got a slip and we were like oh like what can you do and we sort of show each other and it's like the exact same thing so we're like, <laughs> oh, okay like i i thought if it may be like the way that i would personally do it is every team has a specific like secret agenda that they've got to do for like mm. all the missions and uh it's something different right so maybe one team, the explorers, is the one that's exploring the terrain that could then be turned into a Necron terrain piece. Uh, maybe the researchers are uh, researching the Necron terrain pieces that have been created and scoring points that way, while the defilers and the invaders maybe are like trying to destroy those terrain pieces. So if there was more uh, differentials between the actual teams, that would be a bit more exciting from a, a narrative point of view, I think. No, for sure. I think... Um... I've always said it uh, with me with regards to these kind of systems. I don't mind necessarily the fact that they have to stick with Crusade, although I don't like Crusade, right? But I think narratively there's just interesting things that they should be doing consistently to kind of create that sense of place. And also there are so many easier like mechanics and things. So obviously the secret agendas is something I really like. I think there's always something really awesome in uh, doing something that, um, you know, you have to get past your opponent or whatever. And again, like you can do really clever stuff with it. Like it doesn't need to be actually related to the game, but it can be related to your conduct. You know, it's like, I don't know, like, um, you can never say like, even if you gave someone the agenda of you're never allowed to use the word yes in a game, <laughs> like or something like that, you know? And, um, but the only thing is, is you have to be honest with your opponent about it from the outset. Like you have to reveal it to him and say, I'm not allowed to say yes. And, uh, and then like have some weird thing in it or say, I don't know. Like it, it, that's a really bad example that just immediately came into my mind. But like there's fun little things that you can do to muck around with people and create interesting situations. But then also there's broader gameplay things that you can do where you can create like thematic scenarios, like where you're like, you're playing on this terrain on, and, and you're at this part of the world and there's a meteor shower. So if you're not in terrain, uh, you're uh, taking more wounds at the start of the battle round on a four plus. You know, it's like... Yeah, because like- um, I've got your event pack from last one. I was looking through that and they've got theatres of war. So I presume some of the missions had a specific like environmental impact, as you say, a meteor shower or something like that. Um, and also within that event pack, they had like some cool like Xenos specific relics that you can get access to um, for like, either, I guess winning your games or during the course of a game, you can take this uh, specific relic that they've created from this uh, event. And that was something that they did in the Pancalis one really well, where there was loads more of those things that you could get as the weekend went on, which seemed quite exciting from what Richard had told us in this one, there was nothing like that. So there was, at the end of each mission, you got some rewards, but it was basically you can pick a uh, battle trait for your character, or you can gain a hero can gain an extra uh, crusade relic, stuff like that, or more requisition points. Really, sort of bog standard, all within the mechanics of the kind of crusade core missions. But it'd be really cool if there was like a couple of like cards that were either in the event pack or like given to you when you won games. They're like, cool, you've unlocked like this secret. Uh, necron crusade relic here you go you can apply it to one of your characters if you want to you don't have to but you can do that sort of thing that's like unique and custom that they've made for this event would have been really good i think and that was one of the things i was sort of looking forward to that they didn't have so that was a bit disappointing um from that point of view i sort of think like overall i i really enjoyed it but they the map mechanics uh and sort of focusing on the, the team aspect of it didn't really work as well from a sort of narrative storytelling at the very end once uh, all the teams uh you know the winning positions had been decided uh the guy that was running the event read out a narrative little story to explain what had happened to each team based on their positions you know unsurprisingly uh the defilers came last uh so we basically got crushed in the rubble and trapped within the uh the tomb world forever effectively uh whereas the winners for example escaped off uh, and things so that was really cool that they'd done it who, who, nice. who won by the way or is oh, that a spoiler i think it was the explorers because uh, and the guy made a bit of a joke about it the explorers was his team 
uh, and he was also doing all the bookkeeping. <laughs> so, so, and they they happened to win. Uh, so, I can't remember what the, team I was on like, when I did it. We won the team I was on, but I can't remember. Um, what it, was. I, it could have been that same team because um, I think they had gone down a place. Oh wait, did they win it? There, there was two that was always in in the top spots, basically. Uh, I mean, and it was. I think it was it, the explores or the researchers. I think were the two that uh, were first and second. I think third place was the uh, invaders, I and mean, then fourth was defilers. So I don't think the scores. Yeah, I can't remember exactly. I don't think the positions changed all that much. A few might yeah. have swapped places though. Well, I can't remember exactly the name of the team, and 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 again to illustrate how little I was. Uh, uh, worried about the victory of uh, of our team, I I uh, I don't think I've even got the 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 the, the, the cardboard anymore. I think I just uh, I, when I was moving house, I think I just got rid of that. So uh, in 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 transit, I was like, ah, whatever. Um, but um, yeah. yeah, man, like I think that's the thing with it, though. It's like, yeah, I think obviously it sounds like there's a lot of really interesting things that are going on with it. For us, when we did it the first time around, the, 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 you, you obviously referenced the fact that there were these areas, these battlefield conditions. They never really factored into anything. Like, you know, the first game, you sort of paid attention to it. But by about the third, fourth game, you're like, what are we doing again? What's going on? And I think that's the thing with this stuff. It's like, okay, we've got this map mechanic that we have to think about. We've got all these... It's like, it's just layers. It, it was just... Which is why it's good that... Um, Everyone was turning up with low-level armies. Like everyone was using baseline, fresh new crusade forces, and also we were all obviously majoritively just playing thousand-point games. Because I swear to God, if you had to play like proper two thousand-point games of forty k and factor in all of the crusade mechanics, I just don't think you could ever manage it. I just yeah, it's just so, too much. What was interesting about that is uh, Richard was like, oh yeah, you're playing a thousand point games, you still get two and a half hours, like, you got plenty of time. Every single one of my games bar one, pretty much ended up, sort of, not on the wire, but, you know, like, ten minutes to spare, fifteen minutes to spare, I think. Uh, one yeah. of them went down to literally, like, zero on the clock as we were finishing the last turn. Um, so I was a bit like, even though it was a thousand point game, you know, it still took the average amount of time that a 2000 point game at a tournament would take. And I don't know if that was because the extra complexity or because we just knew we had the time. So being a bit more casual and having a, like, you know, chit chatting as we're playing, that mm. might have been the case. I think, uh, like I said, uh, I think one game I forgot the kind of mechanics of the mission because not all of them had, had it, but, um, and I think some of them do unfairly penalize. Uh, some opponents so one of them was like if you failed a psychic test you would take d3 mortal wounds uh but the game i did that on had no psychers but if you were a psychic heavy army that would maybe be quite punishing um, yeah that would really muck you around and i knew like, oh, and one of the others sons. Ah! yeah one of them was uh one opponent uh had death guard and um uh, two of his games had the special mission rule which was you can't use any rules that mitigate damage so all his minus one damage abilities across his whole Ooh, army is completely howling. removed um so yeah that sort of really hindered <laughs> some some of his ones um, yeah no that is uh that is most not... of the time it was uh, the, the one that happened a few times is you can set things up for you can set free units up for in teleportation chambers before the game if you want to um which i don't think anyone ever used um just because the mission didn't really need it i think mm. um but yeah, I think overall it was really. I really actually enjoyed, and I know you don't like it, the crusade mechanics. Well, I that's loved, good. No, I mean, uh, it, it, look, just because it's not for me, mate, doesn't mean that I don't accept that some people like it. I think uh, for me, I just think the problem is, is that I don't like it as a system because I just think it's just a load of unnecessary complexity. I think there are more elegant ways that you can create narratives and create fun gaming systems. I think the game of 40k is complicated enough, especially with the way that it is today. I think, you know, Necromunda, fine. By all means, put similar mechanics into a Necromunda. No issue with that. Blood Bowl. Um, any of the sort of those systems, 
fine, but like 40k, it's just too vast. It's yeah, like, I just, mean, th- th- maybe because I had Marine, so relatively elite force, and true, predominantly, true. Oh, like all of my sort of, you know, squads of the character only had like one upgrade on them actually no one of them one of them gained two by the end uh one of them predominantly had a, a battle scar which was like not affected by aura abilities um and then my captain i sort of tried to level up as much as possible and gave him his own like quest to kill as many things as possible um so so i kind of created and forged my own narrative um via that basically uh what was interesting though is i got tabled in pretty much all my games nice uh, bar, bar one where one squad survived so it was amazing how deadly the game is and i don't know if that's because i'm taking marines and we don't have armor of contempt anymore um or well, that's a question. just the sort of Were general you using the balanced data slate uh what well, i was and um i sort of said to my opponents do you mind if we use the balanced data slate just it effectively just gives me sticky objectives right that's the only yeah, yeah, benefit yeah. for me and actually that won me games right that if it wasn't for that i probably wouldn't have won the games i did and it did allow me to win games even though i was tabled because i was still on objectives uh that my opponent just couldn't get to for example Um, although in a couple of games there were some hilarious moments where i came off of objectives and then they did a kind of mid-game teleport um or teleport shunt onto objectives so one of them did the war uh, not the wild to jump sorry uh with his psyche to steal an objective and another one did the uh the votan uh i would say i einkin the big exosuit character uh oh and, yeah, well, the, and, and the heathkin um guy could do it as well so he did it both with them uh managed to teleport around uh the board yeah yeah, yeah uh, to yeah. like try and steal my objective so it Classic. is a benefit, but it's also a hindrance if something can teleport mid-game. Um, but it did really help. Uh, but yes, I'm still getting blown off the table. <laughs> so I don't know yeah. if that's just the power level of the game in general and um, sort of symptomatic of Ninth Edition or the fact that I have aren't as a lot durable of as they need to be. I have a lot of opinions on that, but I really don't want to get into them again here because I worry okay. that I'm repeating myself. Uh, 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 going back to the Bant State 8, so I was using it. Richard was trying to use it. He couldn't always. So um, for him, he did a mixture of Imperial Fist plus his Marauder Bomber, which actually visually fitted in really well because it had some yellow stripes on. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, his, um, some of his Phobos units had like grey uh, cloak, camera cloaks on and stuff. So it looked really similar that was his nice. army so i had emailed the warhammer world events team and said uh can the guard use their new codex they said no but they can use uh, the old balance state state for them and they can also use uh, one of the old crusade books for the previous uh, guard codex uh, with their crusade mechanics i replied back and said does that mean we're using the new balance state slate no reply and i didn't ask since i assumed it meant we were uh, and you know, with my opponents, I just checked. Uh, Richard was using it uh, for his Marauder bomb because actually he he didn't realise he got to use the old one. So his uh, Marauder, I think from game two, after I mentioned it to him, he was like, "Oh, so and he double checked the rules. It's Titanic, so it basically got uh, Armor of Contempt on his um, uh, Titan and a two up save, I believe, uh, which made it a lot more durable." Um, but in one of his games, one of his opponents basically refused to play with uh, the balanced state state and said, no, 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 I don't do that. Uh, so he didn't get it, basically. And okay. one of the other issues that Richard came up against that I didn't come up against was people with previous Crusade armies from the last event. Uh, so in the... I don't think it said it necessarily in the event pack, but it said it on the Eventbrite listing that if you want, you can bring... Um, your old uh, Crusade army from the previous one, but you should only play it against people that have also done the same, uh, and you should really have a fresh army to play with as well. So in Richard's first game, uh, he played against this lady with orcs um, who had brought her army over from the previous uh, Crusade event, 
Uh, but what she did is because Richards was a fresh one, she just removed all the all the upgrades and just played it as a fresh one. Uh, mm. I think the other two people that Richard also met, so he met three people in total that were playing with Crusade armies. Uh, they sort of just said, uh, I think they just refused basically and just said, "Oh, this is the only one I've got." Um, and Richard plays, uh, not Richard, but just in general, you play the Crusade point difference uh, and you halve it, and that's how many CP you get. And I think. The person had Which like, is a terrible balancing mechanic, by the uh, way. Well, I think Richard ended up with because he's normally starting with like one or two CP uh, because mm. his Marauder Bomber has to be taken as a super heavy detachment, which costs you three CP off the bat, and then there was something else yeah. which costing him CP. So he wasn't starting with much in that game. I think he started with eighteen CP because the yeah, guy had like right. a forty power level difference uh because well, he made 40 power level in the last crusade event did he well the, well the, i think this was game three or four so it was even then like really well hold on let in, me see what my games, did he? Uh, well mine was 13 power level by the end 13 what was it? crusade 40. points sorry yes well if you yeah if i don't know then maybe he just got really good at updating Oh, yeah, got Upgrading real good yourself. at working who, who the books knows? on that one. Like, this is the problem, though, with that stuff, though, right? And that's one of the other reasons I don't like Crusade is because I don't trust people, um, and I just know that people will, will just exploit it because for some reason, even though there's no money on the line, we're all at a completely fluffy, non-competitive event, and there's no individual scoring. Like, it doesn't matter if you win all five games. Someone will turn up and stomp you with an army that's completely overpowered and be like... Ah, I won all five games. Is that brilliant? Well done. Well done. You know. Yeah, I, I but I, yeah, I think that's always going to be the case, right? Um, I know it is. I know it is. But it's but like you, you don't. I think it's you extra sort of frustrating it, in the confines of Crusade you, because yes. there is such an opportunity for that to be allowed. Uh, and and yeah, I think that everyone should be trying to theme their armies a bit more narratively and to an extent tone down the power level of your armies. Um, but it's always tempting like, but, right, to but like why min-max. Does that person how can that person not have understood that, like, like what you're doing will not be fun for other people, right? Like, do you not, like, are you that, like... Are you, are you, yeah, are you, that I, you know, maybe to, they're like, really wedded emotions? to their army. Like, oh, it's my precious army that I've been growing. I don't army, want to it always lose wins, a thing. Because it's... Because every but one of you them should... has got feel no pain and, you know, like, they're all, like, mad. Yeah, I mean, in I guess in an ideal situation, if you don't have a, a, a fresh one, it's like you could just remove upgrades from that you can still play it you can still score your points but just remove like a bunch of upgrades so you're playing an equal crusade point um level basically yeah, tone it down so just yeah exactly you say like, tone it down uh so yeah. that should be doable um but then i suppose you're not getting the benefits of the loads of games you definitely played well you know that's conjecture <laughs> speculation there dan uh i let's assume that they have um, we will is, assume is, that they have <laughs> that's what I said that. loads of games they definitely played yeah um, so yeah I I mean despite that I, I think Richard still did quite well in his games we both went 3-2 uh, overall in, just, a, just a wax lyrical about this though just a last little bit in a way is that worse than cheating in a competitive tournament setting um so you saying if someone's outright cheating with their crusades no not cheating or just, just inflating, min-maxing. yeah like creating a scenario where they have taken advantage of a casual environment and have effectively pushed themselves to the point that they have uh, basically they've put they've pushed it so far that they're bringing an army that is evidently stronger than every other opponent that they will encounter and it's that thing where it's like is that worse than just cheating in a grand tournament setting? Because to me, I think because of the because of the nature of it, like I expect cheating from high level competitive play because there's a, a, a reasonable set of expectation that people will want to win at all costs because there's incentives to win. And, yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. But that's the thing, right? Like as we've said many times, right? There's no real incentive for you not to cheat in 40k uh, at a competitive level because if you can continue to win and play well there's lots of ways that if you're able to that you can financially 
you know, reward yourself through, you know, various social media and or kind of prestige situations. Mm. And that's kind of evident within certain uh, elements of the competitive community. There's a lot of people in the competitive scene who have been ca- caught cheating multiple times, but they still continue to go on. And again, I'm not condoning that, nor am I saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying that that has been relatively well observed on a consistent basis. In addition to that statement, I kind of understand why you would do that because of the reasons that that is a thing to do. But is it is it strangely worse to turn up to a narrative crusade event with an army that is literally way stronger like exploiting it to the extent that every single unit is like max well, it's like oh yeah yeah like- i mean it it depends on how they've done it if they've given themselves fictional points that they say they've played which and they, they definitely ha- they didn't. haven't They're, this is all this is all it, legit it, if that was the case if they all all they've if, just yeah. played extra games that they weren't meant to have like between let's say between the first crusade event and the second one they played a bunch of games yeah. with that army and they've kept that yeah going that is yeah. kind of unfair if they've outright just sort of cheated and given themselves a crusade points that they don't deserve because they've not played those games that to me is just cheating but they could have just been very canny with their upgrades and min maxing stuff so they could have gone okay well uh if i give this unit the mvp this uh game because even though it didn't deserve to be the MVP, I'm going to give it because it gains free extra experience. Therefore, I can level yeah, it up. Yeah. And they could have tried to just maximise how they level up every single unit in their army. And then when they do level up, you get the choice to pick or roll, and they just pick. And they go, okay, cool, I'll give it reroll ones to hit because that's the most like efficient thing out of the options, let's say. Oh, yeah, or totally. I'm going to upgrade, uh, give it a special relic to ignore line of sight or whatever it might be. Like they, they could have just done that and been very optimised and efficient while still playing within the constraints of the Crusade um, core rules. Uh, yeah. I, that's legal, right? But it's probably not in the spirit of the event, I would say. Um, yeah, that's fair. Because that's I could fair. have gone like a lot more try hard and like given uh, units like my plasma receptors, I could have deliberately leveled them up to give them, you know, reroll the hit rolls. But I didn't. And in fact, I don't think they ever leveled up in the game because I just never yeah, yeah. put the points in them because I just, you know, was doing my own thing, right? So, yeah, I guess it depends on how they're doing it, basically. But either no, way, it's probably not in the spirit of the tournament but i think because it's seen as like a casual well, it's not a thing. tournament no no sorry event let's say event event there um, you go no but and, there and was an incentive saying. to win though the winning team all got trophies and the trophies, what trophies were, did they get real trophies uh yes trophies made using the <gasps> uh, necron terrain pieces oh. um not quite yeah sort of weird obelisky terrain pieces uh, with a oh, little plaque good. on it as well um, oh, we just got a bit of cardboard. Yes, the the card sort of certificates and stuff like yeah, that. I no, there, there wasn't even that. Um, that. No, it was like a proper ter- uh, proper oh. proper trophy this time round, which was good. Got, that was I really exciting because we saw that in the cabinets the day before. And we're like, yeah. oh, they're pretty nice. That must be for this event. Uh, we also saw the Age of Sigma campaign system that from their narrative event which looked really cool as well you get like a little yeah, mat yeah, yeah, yeah. and cards and like little chit t- chit t- tokens uh yeah, and, yeah. You know, i think you're you're mining for like realm stone or something that looked really cool that looked really amazing so when this one is effectively just like a binder full of stuff it's slightly underwhelming in comparison to what else has been done in terms... But I, I, I get You're it, a right? mixed bag of emotions with this event, Phil. You like it on one level, you're frustrated well, with other aspects of it. Yeah, I, I would say I the Crusade... At least I'm consistent, is what I'll say. The I crusade, just didn't like it. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, the Crusade <laughs> mechanics, I'm happy with. I liked upgrading my army. I like playing the missions. I think the missions... Could have been a bit more unique. They were kind of cool, but the actual you're just holding objectives at the end of the day. It was it was a bit boring. Um the the aspect of the teams and moving around the maps I think was very poor and the kind of cool unique stuff that makes the event special uh wasn't really there in terms of the theming. I just want little card bits of tat that say here's a a xeno blade that you can give to your captain and it gives him i know plus one damage like just really basic stuff that they've created that is custom 
and unique to this event. That's what I really wanted. And I think the fact you that just, they you were just sort want of wedded... them to come over to you and go, you're special. Well, basically, I'll tell you what they didn't do, even though I was special. Uh, I'm a Warhammer Plus subscriber still. There was no free thing. <gasps> oh, I mean, I mate. forgot to ask, and I think no one else asked, so they just didn't do it. I think it only happens at the uh, 40k events because everyone basically demands it. They like they get enough people asking. They're like, oh, fine, we we'll give them. But some that free was guys. a 40k event. Well, I know, but it's not 40k like sort of tournament crowd, right? That are more in the know. We have to ask at the double. I don't have one of plus. I will still ask them this weekend. What are you giving <laughs> you should us? Do. Because I want something. I will. I will ask every yeah. time because that is a con- that is something that they have. It, it's basically like a, said a contractually obliged thing, is the way I think. Yes, about it. it's the, it's in their terms of service, right? Like that is part of the that is part of the offer. Yeah. Unless so, they've removed it from the website, should we just quickly have a look? I mean, you go, go, go for it. I, I'd, yeah. If, if they were meant to do it, and maybe they just forgot, that's a bit disappointing. Um, Warhammer Plus, subscribe to Warhammer Plus. Accept cookies. I almost wouldn't be surprised if they don't mention it anymore. Exclusive subscriber villages. Uh, The ultimate thing. Exclusive animations. Premium league weekly shows. Dominate the tabletop. Uh, Explore the vault. A new era of war. Oh, hang on. Exclusive models. Uh, More uh, often. More one more often. Oh, maybe they've removed it. Maybe they just advertised it as part of the service and then removed it retrospectively. Yeah, I mean, maybe, or it's still in there, but they just don't put it up front on that one because that's like a global maybe. thing and maybe. that's a very UK-specific thing. Um, yeah. So it'd be interesting. We'll, we'll find out on the weekend, I guess, whether that's still continuing. Maybe it isn't, well, and that's why... Um, and Yeah, my fault for not asking, really, because they could have just told me up front what, what, what the deal was. Uh, 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 what well, you're looking at I was going to say the other thing was they, they did say you could so you bring 50 power level you can bring up to 75 so the idea is you could upgrade uh, different units and swap things out and have a bit of a sideboard or you can play 75 power level games um, but no point did that happen like uh, I, I just didn't uh, ask any of my opponents if they wanted to play 75 power level because not everyone did have it I think some people just put took the 50 and ultimately i just stuck with the same list the whole weekend because i was like ah, I i've been quite enjoying it the um i wanted i so i had a talk from my list actually i had uh, one captain i had it was a patrol uh i had my captain i had uh three squads of uh intercessors five man squads one with thunderhammer one with power fist and one with a chainsword uh and then i had uh three squads of inceptors two with the assault bolters and one with the plasma and it had one con- uh, relic contemptor chain fist and multi-melter um and i was tempted to take the second contemptor as well because the contemptors are really good once you can get them into combat um but ultimately actually i found because of the sticky objectives the regular in- um intercessors were really good so i decided to keep with my list and i was quite enjoying it as i went on but yeah it might have been quite nice if they had specifically told people yeah like day one you do 50 power level day two you do 75 so there feels like a bit of a progression um in terms of ha- how other games were going and like you're growing your force but actually I've, i found 50 power level was like quite a good size to to play out so i didn't mind that too too much um but i think some people did do 75 i think yeah, um definitely the armies have got in the cabinet most of them had 75 power level they put in there so obviously some people did take a larger force um but just i didn't don't think a lot of people thought about doing it even though it was an option for the weekend fair fair mate no look i mean you know it's cool to hear that the broad vibe has been positive controversially just to go back to warmer plus for a moment it looks like it's been removed from the service they've basically seemingly just killed it what's interesting about that though is that ultimately if they did advertise it at the moment that people were subscribing to it back in august and has retrospectively removed it i'm not sure where they actually stand on that like technically Mm. if you signed up to a service and that was advertised as part of that service at the point of, you know, the point of your transaction. Then maybe you know, like my, my like phone me, contract like gets updated all the time. Yeah. It'd be like me selling you a car and then you're turning up and you, you, you know, you already gave me the money and I showed you a picture of it with wheels and you turn up and go, Oh yeah, no, that, I, I've decided I don't want to give you those. It's like, you know, it's like, Oh, hang on. 
Uh, I bought it. Bought it with wheels. It's yeah. like no, 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 no. I never told you. I, I, I may have. It, I may have implied it had wheels, but if you read well, the well, here's the thing. It might be, as you say, that they've option. they've removed it for new subscribers, uh, but maybe they maybe. honor it for pre-existing ones. Although how they they would know the difference, I I've got no idea. Maybe you've just got to ask maybe. for it, and they give it to you. Basically, maybe, maybe they'll kick. It. All you got to do is kick up a stink. And yeah, uh, give me and, and my janky dice. That's what I want. Exactly, exactly. It's like yeah. it's like uh, yeah, one of those uh, one of those things. Give me my dice, stab you. Yeah. Give me my I mean, dice. I, I would say, even though I think there were elements of it that were a bit disappointing in terms of like the the, the immersion of the teams and how I, what I just didn't like is that the the score system was so secretive. You didn't know what you were contributing to. I actually suspect that only the champions of the teams only their scores actually mattered and mm. it doesn't actually because uh, i was the champion for the last round so game five and it, they basically said is is a, is a win or loss if you if you win we, we've won something right like uh, but whether we'd be in first place or not who knows that was never explained but if we lost or i lost as as one of the two champions yeah that was it we, we had no chance so i think Game four, we'd moved up to third place, and then I lost my last game. And I presume maybe the other champion lost. Cause I don't know how his game went. So, so our team lost, and we ended up back in fourth. Like, uh, I don't know if actually the everyone else on our team playing games that weren't champions, their scores actually contributed. It could just be that they're having a fun game, and it has no impact on the team score. And that was one of the things that I found a bit frustrating. It was just there was no transparency behind any of that and it would have been more exciting to know that yeah if, if more of us won our games we were actually helping bump up the score i suspect it probably did but you know who who knows um who knows behind the scenes i would definitely go back to another one i optimistically hoping it was it's maybe a bit more interesting and going to be more along the lines of the Pancalis one that richard has done before with the gene stealer cult infecting other people that all sound really good one of my opponents had one of the cards from that event because they'd been to and I got to see like the infection card and how that worked. So that all sounded really interesting. Uh, mm. So, I, yeah, I sort of feel like this one, they were sort of stuck with a system because it was a two-part campaign, basically. So hopefully the mm. next one, they can be free of the White Dwarf four-player campaign system, which is what it's designed for, not a team event, that they come up with something more interesting and that can be a lot more thematic. Um no, put, put a bit more effort in terms of tats. Uh, I don't need a binder of stuff. I just want a bunch of cards and a, and a map or something, you know. Yeah. Fair. No, I agree. I think, obviously, that sort of extra stuff, all that sort of, those bits would definitely enhance the overall offering. Yeah. I, I, I did love the terrain aspect of it. And, you know, if they mm. could have carried that on or made it, uh, had more terrain in which to make, make that more prevalent as the games went on. That would have been yeah. really cool. And they I feel like they sort of missed a trick by not having individual teams having specific missions around those uh terrain pieces based on the fact that we're meant to be, you know, researchers, invaders, defilers and stuff like that. So I felt like that was that was a missed opportunity that just felt so obvious like I was a bit surprised that they didn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well it does seem odd, doesn't it, that they don't sort of yeah, just sort of do more to kind of amplify the individual attributes as well. It's like, oh, you know, you guys are the defilers, so you should be doing a sabotage thing. You guys are the explorers, so you should be exploring. Yeah. You know, like, just simple things. It, it thing makes that, sense. Like, and I think like, um, it, w- it was really unclear, basically, like, where we were on the map. Like, you could go to the front and see where it was. And it was only on Saturday morning they had done, like, a little projection of the kind of map system. And they'd done, like, d- coloured dots to represent your team and actually drawn arrows to show where you had last been and i was like oh that's really cool like we can see where we were were the last previous turn because we'd only seem to move a few squares so i'd assumed that was the movement from the previous round not since the beginning and then after the last game they re-showed us that screen again but it hadn't actually been updated so it was the same positions as before so i just assumed that was an error and not that no one had moved around but if they had done that between every single mission and had like a little briefing of you know narrative explanation to explain where people had done had gone and what we were doing, that would have helped 
a lot more with the overall immersion of the campaign so yeah that bit was all a little bit confusing and you know obviously i think you know trying to do like a graphical thing uh with tiles and moving people around and stuff probably would have been a bit too much because they probably made it in like photoshop or powerpoint or something so maybe that, that's why i did it once and didn't ever update it because it was something someone did overnight but yeah that was helpful when we did have it but it was a shame you only had it once yeah no for sure man um just to say i've i'm 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 digging deep into this uh warhammer plus shenanigans and um I don't know. It's interesting, right? Because, like, if you follow the, the, the trail, the breadcrumbs, there obviously was a time where they felt like they had to give us exclusive event things because they did on multiple occasions, right? Uh, on a handful of occasions we received... Well, early doors we received the um, the cards and then we got dice and then they did dice again and they did this proactively. Um so there's obviously the implication that they were very under the impression that they needed to that they needed to do something. Yeah. Um, well, it was interesting because there was a time when we had specifically emailed them, or well, I had emailed them, and they the Warhammer World Events team says, "Oh yeah, we're not really like doing that anymore." And then I think it was like a week later, after I think the LVO, the LVO had done like this, um, or Games Workshop had done an article about the LVO talking about the future of the ITC and the what Games Workshop is doing for the tournament scene and how all TOs are going to get like digital codes uh, for all the codexes and how winners will get digital codes for codexes and stuff like that. As part of that, they had specifically said, oh, yes, and if you're Warhammer Plus subscriber, you're going to get like some goodies for going to these events. And then it was after that event when we had gone to one of the 40k, I think it was the doubles, and we, everyone had just said to them, like, oh, what's our free thing then? Uh, and that's when day two they gave us the dice. Um, so I think it, it seemed like either they had just miscommunicated internally or there was a time where they weren't going to do it and they were stopping. And then maybe because uh, the article came out that said they were, they were then having to like, honour that uh, new piece of advertisement. Yeah, indeed. I mean, this is the thing that's really interesting about it, and I'm tracking back through it. They do things like, so, like, even if you go back real far, right, like, real far, um, like, basically to the initial con uh, conception of it, and here we go, yeah, so it says very early on, for the fans, official warm events and warm for subscription is going to make you feel like a champion at each and one, uh, at each one you attend, even if you lose your games. You get warm plus experience, including perks such as VIP badges, priority access, and free merchandise. Right? These are the things that they yeah, said. Yeah, we've definitely doors. never had priority access. I mean, never no, had never had priority badges. access. Never, never had badges. But we have had merch in the form of we dice. have had some merch. It's interesting, and cards. though. How? Cause it's funny. I'm not saying they did do this, but I, I swear I saw messaging to that effect before for year two, and I feel like they were honouring year two because they have honoured it. But it seems to have disappeared from their community site now. Oh, yeah, I I'm mean... not saying that they've retrospectively removed anything because I can't prove that. But what I am saying is I feel like I re- definitely remember seeing it. In the past, yes. Well, games I should do like to update their websites about. We don't know games. that. That is conjecture. Although I think it has been categorically proven on occasion, not by us. So we'll just uh, yeah, we'll just move along, Phil. Let's not uh, you know become a couple of conspiracy loons. <laughs> let's uh, let's uh, let's wrap up this conversation. You need to talk about the games. So let's hear who you played, what you played, and how the general vibe went. No need to go through excruciating detail, but let's. Uh, Let's see what you uh, let's see what you got to say. Okay, so game one, like I said, got to pick a table. Ended up against Votan. Oh, I hear they're good. Well, I know it, you, you'd think they're good, and actually they were pretty good. Uh, so lovely army, uh, a guy called Jay, who's actually well done, podcast Jay. himself. He's uh, Sprue and Brews, or at least he's part of that collective team. Sprue um, and Brews. Or I've definitely heard of it before. I don't think I've listened to it, though, but I'm aware of them. Um, 
so he's part of them. Nice chap. Lovely army. Never played Votan before. Uh, he said it was like a fresh army that it uh, painted up. Um, uh, it looked really cool. It was basically the uh, limited edition army box plus the Hecaton land fortress as well, which Solid. I can tell you is well art. Um, yeah, they're, they're tough to get rid of, aren't they? Yeah, so we were doing like a hammer and anvil uh, star deployment, I think it was. Hold on, mm, let me just double check. Mm. Uh, no, table quarters, that was it. Uh, table quarters. And uh, yeah, I sort of positioned myself uh, to try and maybe get a first hand charge off if I could with my Hecton. So I made the joke that uh, Minotaur Contemptors are always named Hecton something or other. And that he's obviously got Hecton Land Fortress. So we were going to have a Hecton off to see who was the best Hecton, um, which was really fun. So uh, turn one, uh, I think he, yeah, I got to go first. So I basically managed to uh, get decent advance roll, uh, turn my tank into, uh, my Contemptor into uh, all the assault weapons, virus stratagem and white scars. So I could uh, fire all my guns in blazing and then still charge into the Hecton. So I managed to get charge off. He overwatched as he would, uh, and surprisingly, uh, the rail gun, uh, the Magnum rail gun, managed to do a ton of mortal, a ton of not mortal, just a ton of wounds uh, on me because it hit uh, in Overwatch. I think it actually knocked me down to one wound. So I managed to get my charge in, but I was on one wound. Uh, it survived uh, around a combat, even though the Hecaton Land Fortress does six attacks, even though it's, I think, only hitting on sixes. Well, it's, it's Land it's Raider no... equivalent, isn't it? Because Land yeah, Raiders do it's... seven attacks if you've charged them. Yeah, it's, uh, it's no slouch. Uh, so actually, I, I, I stuck it out for like a couple of turns in combat. Uh, before eventually uh, actually I killed it that was it I did kill it in my second uh, turn of combat because uh, I'm doing six wounds a, a, a time with my uh, chain fist on my contemptor yeah, I, I'd taken a bunch off uh, first turn even though I rolled quite badly uh, and then he used his uh, is it bronchi to, to heal it back up the little mm. guy the, the uh, mech mechanic guy with his little robots uh, yeah second turn i managed to take it out uh, but then bronchi charged in and, and smashed up my contemptor with its hammer uh, so that didn't stick around long uh, it was a really good fun game though uh, but yeah the, the votan are pretty good uh, like i alluded to before i was using sticky objectives in fact actually everyone was using sticky objectives in this mission because that was the mission special rule uh, so he was using it as well uh, so I'd come off of one of my objectives just uh, so I could get some more men up the board. Uh, mm. And then he had done effectively a mini de jump with um, his exosuit guy via a stratagem so he could teleport that in and steal one of my home base objectives. I didn't even realize I could do that, even though I'm sure we'd read, uh, talked about it on the podcast. Uh, so that was pretty <laughs> cool. And then I had to run some guys back to try and shift it off him. Uh, but they just got completely wiped out in combat because it's a beast. Uh, mm. my captain went toe to toe with, uh, his, um, I want to say kin. That's, that's, that's like what their captains are, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. The guy in charge. Yeah. Um, so I, I, my but captain, Carl, won. is it a Carl? Is that what they Oh, it's is? Carl, isn't it? Yeah. No, I don't right. know. Uh, kin's just for regular folk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's a yeah. Carl, kin, Carl versus kin, captain. Like... Yeah. Um, yeah. So I managed to kill his captain. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but then my captain just got gunned down uh, in a, in a later turn of combat, and as I have alluded to, I got tabled. Uh, but I didn't did do a decent uh, amount and got to you know turn five when nice. it happened. Uh, in fact, I, I scored a decent amount of points as well. Um, in fact, I managed to score flexing. Uh, flexing. Yeah. So luckily, despite uh, being tabled, I still won. Well done, uh, mate. On objectives, I, I managed to play the objective game very well, um, holding objectives, uh, which is pretty good. It was forty-six to fifty-eight. Uh, it was a really lovely opponent. Um, I managed to kill a couple of his units. He managed to kill all mine. Rolling for like the battle scars afterwards. Uh, none of mine get any. He gets free uh, on some of his units, including his Hecton Land Fortress, and the one that he rolls for. Um, which I think was a uh, Votan specific one. It's basically if he if a land fortress is hit with a strength eight weapon, mm -hmm. I think a six roll to hit does a mortal wound. 
what was it wound drill no six, yeah six rod hit does mortal wound and then basically he he told me later on in the weekend that basically um he went up against in one of his games um all the sisters of battle the squad with the melter guns Oh yeah, the um, the yeah, I know what you're talking about, but I can't remember what they're called. Um, I wouldn't say it's not eradicators. Um, redemptionists, something like that. I can't remember. Redemptionists anyway, are the, uh, uh, the ones with the chainsaws, aren't they? Yes. No, I think no. I redemptionists right. are the Necromunda gang. You were yes. thinking about the repentia. <laughs> repentia, but it's not a repentia. It's the ones with the mouse guns. Anyway, it basically did like eight uh, eight mortal wounds on him uh, in a turn of shooting. I managed to take it out um, just because of that uh, specific battle scar. So I felt like I, I, I'd done quite well on the battle scars uh, front. And then he'd uh, had this cool narrative. So he had his book of grudges as dwarf player from his old fantasy days. So he'd obviously written my name down and all the other players into that and then gave me a little narrative slip Um which was uh, a sort of a special crusade bonus if I wanted to use it between us. And it was in my next game. If I got battle scar, I could re-roll it if my other opponent agreed, uh, which I didn't need to do. But it was nice that he was embracing the kind of crusade mechanics of it. And um, he had a cool like secondary ad- agenda for crusade, which is as a dwarf or Vitan, you're, um, you, you're basically mining for ore. So he had a special like gemstone encrusted uh, objective marker and I got to place it anywhere uh, outside of my deployment zone and he uh, had to try and reach it um, uh, to score some of his uh, objectives which was really cool so he had a cool like little narrative uh, go- going on which I really enjoyed it, uh, he was a really lovely chap he was so lovely in fact that he not got Knight of the Inner Circle because that wasn't a thing because uh, they weren't doing um, favourite army votes, but they were doing favourite player of votes. Him and one other person basically got best player for the tournament because they both got uh, five votes each. Uh, so nice. All of their opponents liked him. So I thoroughly enjoyed my game against him, uh, and obviously everyone else did as well. And it was there a really nicely go. painted army as well. I mean, I've just been checking out Sprues and Brews on... Uh on the interwebs i've been looking at the uh, the charts and looking at the other bits and pieces so um yeah they're doing all right on the youtubes i think they're about five and a half thousand subs on there by the looks of things and then uh they feature in charts that we feature in um intriguingly and this is always a thing that weirds me out with the charts is, is i never know whether we would be better off leveraging ourselves as a hobby podcast or a gaming podcast we always do okay in the gaming charts but then in the leisure charts, we're always kind of a little further down the mixture. But then when I look at people like, you know, Sprues and Brews here, they're very firmly planted in the hobby metric in terms of um, in terms of where they sit on the uh, on the chart system. So you do think to yourself, it's like, is that where I should be? And then how do I even influence that? I have to be honest, the SEO of, uh, which is search engine optimization, of, um, of, of Lookout Sir is appalling. Uh, to be honest with you, it's, um, I need to figure out a better way of managing this. I always worry that, uh, you know, we're potentially losing out on, uh, potential listeners by the poor optimization. Um, but nonetheless, or maybe we're doing it right and these guys are doing it wrong. Who could say? Who um, knows? but anyway, no, I'll check out their stuff. And I mean, it'd be nice to listen to them and, uh, you should do so too, the listener, you, you there. Why not? I can't vouch for whether it's good or not, but Phil seemed to enjoy playing against the dude. So, oh no, he was he was a great chap. Um, exactly. Exactly. Maybe they they do a post uh, crusade report as well. Uh, what, just like put us. over lookout sir, like we just put them over. Uh, no, I don't think I mentioned lookout sir to them. So, oh, let's see. probably. Did oh, I think mention... I, I think I mentioned that I did a podcast, but maybe he didn't take did it he, in. I don't know. Did he take no interest because 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 he's a bigger boy? Probably. Uh, anyway, it's like, game... oh, that's cute. You know, come oh, to me your when podcast, you're... do you? Oh, oh well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did he introduce uh, the podcast top, topic, Phil? Be honest. Uh, no, I think I asked if he had an Instagram account because I was asking everyone because I would tag them in photos, and he said no. But he's part of the uh, Spruce and Brews pod- uh, podcast. Uh, and, uh, I do a podcast as well. He was like, "Good for you, kiddo." Keep yeah, on pound, pound the head and off off you go. I tell you uh, what, though, man. I mean, you scroll a long way down. So they've been doing this for five years, apparently, and there is a 
lot of content that they have done. They've done a lot of varied posts and all the rest of it, and they've obviously got a, a podcast there. And yes, I mean they've been technically they've been at it longer than we have. Wow. Well, not technically they have. I think well we we're approaching so their first their first uh, one ever was um, is it the first of April? Yeah, of April twenty seventeen. We started we started twenty eighteen, didn't we? I I can't remember. I think we did. I think I think this Sounds would be our. Right. I think this year is our five year anniversary. But these mm. guys are. Uh, I know we're going to do something special. We're not. Uh, we're not. We're, we're rubbish. But we might do. You never know. Uh, we'll announce our retirement. That's what we're doing. <laughs> That's true. Um, anyway, game two. This was where yes. we got our first like slip, which allowed us to uh, interact they with the train pieces. And it would become Necron Terrain. Uh, so this one was against Alex, a Krieg player. Uh, <gasps> so he had a really lovely painted Krieg army. So lovely it got in the cabinet of all places. Um, Did your yeah, army got... get in the cabinet, Phil? Uh, no, no, it oh. didn't. Oh. No. Oh. Um, I thought it had a good shot, but obviously it did not because uh, it didn't get in. And there were some really nice armies in there. Uh, Damien Padley, uh, the. Uh, oh, he won it, didn't he again? N- uh, yes, he did. No surprise. What a, um, what a with his, he just turns up every week to a different Warhammer World event in the collects his prize. And co- collects a trophy, yeah. So he's not feel like metal. at this point, and again, I appreciate, here's, here's the weird thing, isn't it? I appreciate they paid their price of admission. And I like Damien. He, he's, 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 he's always seemed like a, like a lovely geezer. But like, do you not feel like if you're just turning up and winning every time and you're, you know, an heavy metal, metal painter, you may as well just be like, hey, guys, like, not being funny. Like, I know you want to put me in. But give someone else a go, would you? Like, it's sort of- yeah, yeah, I mean, so this has been going on for, for years, right? So it's n- no shame on, on Damien. No, He's no, only no, been no, heavy no, metal painter for like a year, right? So uh, I, I, mean, I remember I, I, we I went... Don't think the, I don't think the time lapse of his uh, time as no, one is necessarily... But, but my point is, I, I've noticed this as a thing consistently across Warhammer World events since we very first going. I remember like one of the first events I got in the cabinet and I was super like stoked about it. Second time... I think I, I I didn't get in, but like an heavy metal painter did and won it, and that's happened a few times since. And I I, I sort of do think like most uh, events or, or even competitions always exclude staff, right? I appreciate that they're coming as a punter. They paid their ticket. They are they they they're being treated as if they were just a regular Joe Blogs like everyone else, but at the same time. They obviously live in Nottingham. They can go to these events as much as they want uh, because as much as they can just, afford, or, or can afford because because they're there, right? They've got the yeah. um, uh, availability to it. Whereas we have to go up. We got to travel, uh, or I get a lift. Dri- Are you making the argument like that kids that. used to make when they wanted to play video games around their friend's house or whatever it is? And they'd be like, "You can play it any time." Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Maybe. My point is, like, it's a lot more effort to us. We've got, like, hotel costs and stuff like that, whereas they just live in the area. When we but do my it, po- my, my main we, point is... we care like, more than they do. That's what you're yeah. saying, isn't it? It's like, I think there's a slight difference between if you're a guy that, like, works in the factory, right, uh, of Games Workshop, or even if you work in the office... Uh, and you you paint up your army in your spare time and you enter it in and you win fair and square. I do feel like if you're a professional painter, though, especially if you've already got the accolade of being an heavy metal painter, I appreciate that you've painted your army yourself in your spare time as well. But it's like you're an heavy metal painter. You've already got the gold standard of awards of that job. That job in itself should be enough recognition for... Uh, your painting accolades you know you're a great painter yeah i sort of feel like you're taking away a spot from someone else who is a joe blogs member of public uh for, from entering and i've i've always found that i've had a bit of a gripe about that forever because i don't really feel like it's fair even though i see games workshops stance on it which is oh they're just a member of public as well buying a ticket right that's how they see it but you know if for some reason four or five heavy metal painters all decide to go to the same event and all end up in the cabinet and no one else does, nah, it seems, you know, I mean, I doubt that's going to happen, but that would be incredibly unfair as well. So I, I, it feels like a slightly, 
uh, they're at an advantage because they're professional painters, right? And you get that yeah, with like even uh, regular tournaments, and you get professional painters either attending or um, armies being entered into the best painting category because someone's commission painted an army, which normally yeah. wouldn't be allowed. But if they're if they're there in person, it's normally fine. Um, what, what I will say is this, though, is Damien's Dar- armies keep on winning when he turns up because they are the best, right? They are. Like, we're not saying that. We're not taking anything away from the fact that his Death Watch army or whatever army he had was... Oh, well, well, this was the thing. There was a Black Templars one in the cabinet, and I assumed that was his because I remembered he had uh, Death Watch, and I just assumed he'd painted up a new army, and it was Black Templars. And I voted for this amazing Nurgle army, and it was only later on I was walking past uh, Damien, and I saw it was, he had the Nurgle army. I was like, oh, that's his. Okay. <laughs> like, Because generally I thought that was like the most interesting one. So, you know... He did a great job. He w- it was well deserved, um, but yeah, I think as a as a sort of a, a, a stickler for fairness, I feel like Games Workshop staff or very least painters should be sort of excluded from those uh, kind of uh, you say going into the cabinet and stuff. Uh, especially now, since there's only one painting competition, it's getting into the cabinet as best army. There's mm. no free for all was like there used to be, which was um, you know you could do uh, best vehicle, best unit, best uh, character. Um, best monster, I think, were the ones yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. Oh, one thing they did change, I don't know if they had it before, I think it's new, is you vote digitally now as well. So there's like a QR code that you scan in, you get to uh, vote for which number uh, of the army you want to vote for, and they record it that way. And same for favourite player vote. Uh, although that one's a bit confusing, because obviously when you uh, meet people, shake their hands, ask them their name, you get their first name. And then when it comes to voting for all the players... It's done on cert, uh, f- full names, right? Uh, yeah. So, for example, I wanted to vote for Jay in the first game. He got one of my uh, two uh, favourite uh, player votes, and there was like two, two Js, uh, or there was uh, like a Jason and a J dot R something or other. And I think I vaguely remembered that Jay said his full name was Jason, so I was like, "Oh, that's got to be his." But obviously, like Richie. There was like another, I played against an orc player also called Richard. Uh, I, I heard someone else like was also there called Philip. So it's like, if you wanted to vote for someone that, and there were several people with that same first name, it would be a bit confusing. You've got to like go find them, work out which one of the two or three that there might be who they are. So I felt like there was a bit of a flaw in that system because they didn't you've got actually to come track up with a individual. Name when you enter the door, you've got to be like, I am. <sighs> Good. Yeah. Well, whatever, well, well normally you, know. you just get a player number, right? So you, you just yeah. you go, oh, I'm Phil, player number twenty eight, and people write that down. So they should still maybe go back to having player numbers as well for easy sort of tracking of people's games, um, or you have to, or at least on this regard, maybe if it was done on teams, it would be easier to filter out who if it was clever enough to just show you like the five people that you played against that would be even better because actually what we were given is a full long list of everyone's uh names and you had so to you, sort could of you find vote for people that you've not played in theory yes but Classic. whether people would but i guess they would track it and basically maybe they'd be able to work it out or if someone well, that got was six uh, that votes. was that was an old warhammer world controversy wasn't it that someone got more votes than their games they played <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't know if that was ever... I mean, it sounds like it was possible, but I don't know if it ever happened, right? Like, oh, it's because they were, like, campaigning to, like, get their friends that they went up with to submit favourite games for each other. Hmm. Yeah, anyway, maybe. Funny um, old it, noise, isn't it? Yes. Uh, yeah, the, the, that reminded me. There was something weird when they were doing the announcements for, like, the winners at the end. They they were talking about the team that came second and mm. sort of implied that they w- were meant to win, um, but sort of was like he said something along the lines of oh well the guy uh, cheated well not really cheated but he he got some core rules fundamentally wrong um, so they've ended up in second place or something and it, like they didn't really explain it very well and it was like such off the cuff and I think it was the one of the champions which was obviously the deciders for the teams uh, clearly got something wrong or misplayed a rule or something um, 
and maybe that they got penalised for it, which is why the other team came in first place. And it was just like, wait, what now? <laughs> what was this? And it was just like, so like, never explained. So we never know exactly what that was about. But move yeah, along. That, that was move interesting, along. anyway. Um, yeah, sorry. So game two uh, was against a guy called Alex. Uh, so Krieg, that's where we got to. Yeah, sorry. Yes, uh, really beautiful Krieg, Krieg army. Uh, he's on Instagram. He's the Persian Paints. Uh, you can find him on there. Um, he had uh, two tank commanders, uh, a bunch of infantry, all with like heavy weapons and stuff in them, uh, like uh, officer. Uh, and a couple of other, like, uh, oh, two Sentinels, both with plasma guns. Quite a competitive list, I would say. Um, what was interesting is obviously he had to play with the old guard codex, but was also playing with the old balance status slate to make up for it. And it's like, oh my God, those tanks were brutal. So obviously, there are Toughness 8, Lehman Russes, Tank Commanders, Hit on Freeze, Give Them Orders, Reroll Ones, uh, Toughness 8. Uh, they are uh, two plus save because of the balance state slate. Uh, they're minus one damage because they've got armor of contempt on the old balance state slate. And then he'd given them both the same tank case to make them minus one damage. So it was rough going up against them, especially since they were all kitted out. So one of them was a demolisher cannon, uh, multi melter sponsons, and a las cannon. Uh, because you can just tool it up because it's power level, remember. The other one was Punisher Cannon, multi melter Sponsons, and the Laz Cannon on the whole. And that one he had given from uh, Game 1, or like the beginning of his army creation, a Crusade Relic, uh, because they're tanks. So this is like one of the weird, like... I don't want to say mistakes. One of the weird uh, loopholes, let's say, in the Crusade mechanics is you can give characters relics but there are a couple of vehicles that can that are also characters so they can gain access to relics that they probably shouldn't actually have uh so in this instance he gave them um you can upgrade one of your weapons so sixes to hit do mortal wounds and he put that on a punisher cannon and you're rolling 40 shots because you're still doing grinding advance and in to his credit he was like i've capped it at six per like phase you know sort of to be fair but basically every single turn he's he's bl- blowing a u- unit off the table because it's doing a ton of mortal wounds in addition to its uh regular shooting and then afterwards he was actually thinking oh do you think i should take it out of your list and i was a bit like well you might as well play it as it is for now at least for today and if you want to take it out tomorrow take it out see how your other games go but i think he was sort of not starting to twig that it was quite overpowered um which it was because uh, yeah, I mean, I it, told it feels like a bit away. of a like, uh, feel, oh. feels like quite a broken combo. Um, he was yeah. a lovely chap. Um, I I probably did a few misplays, like, and I I did a risky strategy based on on the it was like table quarters. I was like, I've got to go for one of these tanks. I'll go for the demolisher tank. So I put my contempt up on the the line uh, of the nine inch bubble in the centre um to try and get a turn one charge on his tank commander because otherwise he, he i've got to hide it really far out the back to be out of line of sight if he went first so i've just got to hope i go first i did not go first um in fact i think he won the roll off and, and just um and, and just took the first turn sensibly i should have in fact used a strategy which allows me to outflank uh my contemptor uh which would have at least kept it live for a turn and then i've just got to make the nine inch charge but i was like mm. risky play I'll, I'll go for it. It literally got annihilated. Turn, <laughs> turn one. I just can't make like five up in one saves to save my life. Um, and then from there, it was pretty much like that. Every single turn, I was like losing a, a, um, a unit or two from the tank commanders. The tank commanders were literally doing all, all the heavy lifting in, in this game. Mm. Um, and my yeah, plasma scepters managed to do a few on the other tank with the Punisher, but not really enough to, to dent it. My captain sort of smashed in. Um, like managed to kill a bunch of guardsmen. I think three or four remained. Uh, they just then fell back. And then he just shot me to death, uh, gunned my captain down. Um, and that's sort of how uh, that game went. So I got I got tabled again. Uh, I did the, lose this one. It was uh, 58 to him and 37 to me. Um, so it was a pretty, uh, let's say, let's say rough, rough game. But he, he was a really nice lad. 
Uh, and I actually enjoyed it. And he sort of was like, oh, you're taking it very well. I'd be really salty in, in your situation <laughs> in getting this like slow tabling that was happening. Um, but it was actually a good game. I think I just made a few mistakes with that contempt to turn one, which kind of cost me the game. But I feel like it, uh, I think minus one damage against my army is actually really difficult because I've only really got the uh, plasma inceptors, which do two damage. I've got the stalker bolt, which do two damage. Uh, and then all I have as other anti sort of tank or heavy units is the Contemptor uh, or my Captain, which is geared up with, um, at this point, it was the Relic Blade, so it's doing free damage in combat, uh, potentially up to four if I can get to the Assault Phase. Um, so yeah, very... Uh, minus one damage was like a real hard counter to my army, I found. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's pretty consistently useful, to be fair. Um He's got some great looking stuff though. I was just going through his Instagram. Um, yeah, no, it's a good looking selection. So, uh, no, definitely encourage, uh, I suppose I'll make the effort and, uh, put the, uh, put the, um, the, uh, the, um, names into the, yes. The, uh, uh, but those were the only, uh, um, two that had socials no one else did sadly they're missing out on a trick i feel like people not having a, an instagram hobby account are missing out on some of the joys of the hobby um <laughs> That's it. but That's each, it. each to their own i'm not going to force people to do it um game three was against richard not not our richard but another richard who was playing orcs um it was one of his first games of playing a uh, ninth edition he was like a stall gamer between i think like third and seventh edition uh dropped out um i think you said they're actually around 2018 um and then got back into it uh just recently has uh, done a couple of games so he was like very apologetic up front if he got rules wrong or anything but he did a pretty good job i would say um really fun game uh doing hammer and anvil style coming out at each other from uh either side and then there's like two objectives uh in each person's deployment zone two in the middle and you got some extra points if you could steal your opponent's uh, home objective, basically. Uh, I, I won the roll-off, so I gave him first turn because I wanted him to sort of come towards me. And his first turn was literally, uh, okay, I'm not moving. Uh, I'm going to roll for the jump. Fails the test. And he's like, okay, cool, it's your go. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> like, that's all he did turn one was try and get the jump off. So then my turn, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll make sure to uh, position my Marines about a little bit so he can't, like, to jump into my rear lines and then push forward. So I sort of charge forwards with my Contemptor and Captain and stuff like that. Um, it was a really cool game. It was very close. I managed to, like, score two points for one of the secondaries early game. So I was slightly ahead, but we pretty much neck and neck down to the very last turn, um, which was really interesting. So when he had to jump one of his units in uh, one of the late turns, it was sort of into the midfield, and we were, like, mostly fighting over those um, objectives in the middle. Uh, so towards the end, I was starting to run out of people, right? Feeding these mobs of, uh, orcs. So I, and uh, I was also aware that he could to jump. So I was keeping the two on my backfield objectives, but I was like, okay, I need to get score more next turn. So I'm going to have to move some guys off, uh, objective. So I moved one of the squads up to try and eventually get into the middle objective. And then with his last person that could to jump, he to jumps his, uh, weird boy, his psyker into my home field objective uh oh funnily enough i think the turn before he tried to do the same thing but what he'd done is he'd jumped his pain boy who was actually being a real pain because he was so deadly because it's like the claw thing just does a ton of damage he jumped the pain boy uh i heard uh overwatched uh as he charged in and managed it because he i think he only had a couple of wounds left so i managed to kill him in overwatch um, and then another thing that he did later uh, before that was he had jumped uh, not Gazgul Fracker is what he called him, which was his warlord using the old Gaz model plus a banner bearer. Um, I don't think he actually did jump them. We were using a, a rule where you can just stick things in teleport uh, pre-game. That was one of the kind of campaign things. So he'd done it that way. So he'd uh, uh, deep struck them down in front of my plasma inceptors. I warned him that I could all spec scan them. Uh, and it did have to be out of twelve inch range, and mm. he can either take it on the chin, or he could move them further back, or or put them somewhere else. Uh, but if he was outside of twelve, to not get 
um, or spec scans, he wouldn't be able to charge, even if you could get bonuses to your charge roll. Um, so he was like, no, no, I'll take it. And I managed to do a ton of shots in uh, the Auspex hand and knock him down to like one wound, I think. <laughs> um, and I try to think if he, no, he did get into combat eventually. That was it. Uh, he'd killed, he got in, killed a bunch of my plasma inceptors. Um, I then uh, shot at him with uh, one of my like intercessor squads and killed him and then realized I didn't actually want to kill him by shooting because actually I wanted to my captain to get another like kill tally so mm-hmm. I said actually leave him alive I'll charge in with my captain captain charges in kills him because he's only like on one wound left but then he does his um i think it's like two or three cp two cp probably um to um basically fight on death and then <laughs> so his orc warlord just absolutely kills my captain and he's like y- you don't have to do it if you don't want to because he's technically dead from the shooting and i was like no no like i said I'd, i sh- i shouldn't have done that and i wanted to sort of rewind and not play it so that was fine so we both of our warlords killed each other uh to the death and then for the last bit of the game, because it was right down to the wire, he had, like I said, he had jumped his weird boy into my back lines. So he suddenly scored more from um, having one of my objectives. And then I, in my last turn, needed to somehow pull it out of the bag, uh, basically, which I did. I couldn't uh, do anything about that objective, uh, but I had some guys up in the mid-board. I think I managed to um, use some guys to maybe kill that psyker. I can't quite remember. But anyway, basically what I had to do was a stratagem which allowed me to double move a bunch of intercessors so I could run from the objective in the mid-table all the way up to capture his objective in his deployment zone by getting a like quite a big advance roll when you can move and then move in advance uh, through the stratagem. And that basically, because you score at the end of the turn because it's like uh, GT star. Um, it basically meant I got my kind of score one, two, three, slash more, but I also got an extra two points for uh, having his uh, objective as well. So that one was really close, down to the wire, but I managed to effectively pip him at, at the last minute. So I got 40 points and he got 33. So it was like a really close game, that one. Mate, no, it sounds it, man. I mean, well done uh, on getting through it. I think, um, so day one, that's all the games for that one, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, And you finished on a final tally of? 2-1. Two, 2-1. One. Two, one. Two wins. Not bad going. Not bad going. I think, you know, setting you up well for the, the day ahead. So um, I know, I was pleasantly optimistic. Really... I was like, oh, well, that, you know, went... Pretty well. Oh, again, I got tabled in that game as well. Oh, actually, no, that was the one time I had one squad left. It was like that. Those were the only guys I had left, but I'd still scored for objectives because I had sticky objectives from the um, other guys. That was it. Mm. Uh, so that was <laughs> that's the only game where I wasn't tabled, and I still only had one squad left alive uh, <laughs> by the end, basically. Wow. Yeah. So game four, which was uh, Sunday morning. I was one called uh, Sacred Ground. I was on uh, one where there's loads of like sort of little L-shaped ruins all over the place. So lots of line of sight blocking, which is really cool. I was up against Knights, a guy called Michael. He was really lovely. I think Richie had actually played him um, on Saturday um, because he told me some stories about watch out for that night player that will will just like auto blow up his knights. (laughs) And I was like, oh, is it this one? Almost like that's in the rules for him to do so, the cheek. No, I know it was. It was. It was indeed. Um, this was a fun one because obviously we now had Necron terrain that we could again interact with and uh, teleport around with. But that's what I rolled for because uh, I deliberately chose the side because I was a defender. So I chose the side that had Necron terrain piece, hoping it would get me something good. Uh, mm-hmm. But that actually meant I did a fundamental misplay from turn one. Um, so we were doing like a Dawn of War style deployment. He had one big knight. Uh, two armagers with the melt gun chainswords and one helvrin uh, with like little auto cannon guns. Um, and at this point, I was determined to. I sort of worked out the night uh, night before that I could try and level up my warlord. I needed to get like thirty odd experience over the next two games. I was like, this is somehow going to be doable. Maybe it wasn't quite so many. It was quite a lot though. It was over twenty mm. at least. 
I need to get locked. But I was like, if I give him MVP for uh, for both games, if I can maybe get like Slade Warlord. Plus, there was this. Um, uh, I think it's like searching for relics secondary, where you search each objective, and if you can then roll under those uh, the number that you, of the number that you've um, searched for, you can get six uh experience and you can give it to any one person so i was like that's a cool way of giving it uh upgrading your um i'm grading my captain so i was trying to do that in these uh this mission so i moved my captain forwards um because uh i got to go first uh even actually i think i got chosen to go first because I, I wasn't sure i actually wanted to go first in this one. Oh yeah because you're all playing a version where you can choose to go first. Yes, yeah, so in this one, you uh, roll off to pick uh, attacker, defender, then you do all your deployment, and then you roll off, and the person who wins gets to pick if they go first or second. Um, and I think that also happened in our last game where I got uh, chosen to go first. Yeah, and I don't think I actually wanted to. So most mm-hmm. games I was sort of hoping to go second, uh, but this time went first. Uh, so I moved my captain up onto one of the middle objectives. I moved my plasma inceptors up to screen. I was deep striking my uh, other uh, two incept squads. And then I did also have next to them uh, a squad of intercessors that I was originally going to move up to also form part of that, like lookout sir uh, screen, but I decided to hang back and roll for the Necron terrain instead. And then after I'd done some stuff, I managed to like uh, move my contemptor up into line of sight of one of his guys by getting a lucky advance roll. Uh, I managed to do some damage on one of his small armagers. And then it was like his turn. And I was like, oh, I've got my captain in the middle of the table next mm. to two of his small knights, one of his big knights that he then moved all within line of sight. And I was like, those three Gravis and Scepters aren't going to live long. No. And my captain is hideously exposed, uh, which it was, basically. Uh, so, yeah, my captain died in his turn one quite quickly. Mm. But this was a great game because uh, Sticky Objectives helped me a lot in this because uh, mm. I had uh, the Contemptor and two squads up on one side of uh, the board and the uh, another squad down at the bottom side, along with the Captain and uh, Inceptors that basically died. Uh, but banished, I basically managed to see off one of his uh, armagers that he was then running away from from the Contemptor. I managed to chuck a bunch of uh, Intercessors up near it uh, get st- get it stuck in combat, do a bunch of wounds, and I think it only had like two left, maybe. Uh, and then he, in one of his turns, he decided to fall back. So I was like, wait a second. Uh, so basically, I did cut them down stratagem. Uh, so roll a d6 for each model with an engagement range. On a six, you do a mortal wound. Uh, yeah. I don't think I rolled any. If I did, I think I rolled one. So I maybe did one mortal wound, and he had like two wounds left. And then I was like, hold on a second, hold on a second. I've got a white scar stratagem, which is similar to cut them down, but basically every single model gets to swing once in combat, which I did. Uh, and the guy with the thunder hammer managed to like get a couple of attacks through and just like kill him basically so i like it was one armager down thanks to my intercessors and the intercessors were like star of the show of this match uh basically he he slung up another armager into combat with some of my others and then that thunder hammer squad reinforced um uh, uh them so there's a I'll, I'll play some photos up i've not done any yet but there's basically like one armager surrounded by two squads of like intercessors i've just like surrounded <laughs> him in combat and once again the um uh, the thunder hammer manages to, to to do the damage and finish off the the armager basically and then mm-hmm. i'd um in on i put try put, tried to put some pressure onto his back line so his home objective because you score points for grabbing their objectives uh basically came down uh the the ass- assault um inceptors came down tried to do some damage uh onto his uh, little Helvrin that he had back there and uh, charge it in combat. I sort of tied it up in combat for a turn or two and eventually did kill it, but he was basically just falling back and then shooting and de- deleting a squad a turn, basically. So those Inceptors didn't last uh, too long. And then in my last turn, basically, I had uh, one squad left at that point. Mm. He had the Big Knight, which was untouched. Um, he had... That was it, actually. At that point, I'd, I'd managed to kill everything, bar the big knight. Yeah. Uh, so I'd positioned my 
uh, squad back towards the Necron terrain, which I could use and use it as a teleport homer. So I use it to teleport towards his objective, charge into his knight, basically, to try and steal his objective, um, which I could because um, my guys were ob- objective secured and he wasn't. Uh, although it was funny because at one point uh, my inceptors with the assault bolters uh, dropped down charged in one one squad got in and i was like ah i've got that objective because their crusade upgrade was that they're now objective secured um but he was like oh no mine's objective secured as well and i was like oh yeah and then i was like but they're also worth five so he actually still kept that um objective Mm. but anyway i meant to sort of uh try and steal the objective off him in that last turn so i got some points for that but then they got smashed in combat um and i once again got tabled but i did manage to win that game uh so that one <laughs> ended 27 to him 54 to me because i was just sneaking up ahead every single turn because um i could move off of my objectives safe in the knowledge that he hasn't got the movement or ability to get around to the some of the objectives that i had like in the corner of the the board so, so that was work, nice mate. that was a nice win uh, he was a really lovely chap as well. So you're in positive. Uh, you're in positive percentages at this point. Exactly. So I'm doing whatever three, happens. You, you, three you, one. You've had a good. Uh, you've had a good innings. Exactly. And then you've the last game. No, I know. So me and me and Richie did joke about that because at that point we were both. Um, I think we were both three one actually. Yeah, there point. you go. So, we so were, you basically both have have outdone the averages of the event isn't it? yeah we were pulling up our team because obviously our team was mm. renowned for doing badly apparently anyway the last turn uh sorry last mission i'm the, one of the champions because basically throughout the course of the day uh everyone will either be a champion or a cartographer right because mm-hmm, of the mm-hmm. numbers uh so i end up being the champion for the last game um I go on a table and I'm, I think I was meant to be playing a Sisters of Battle person. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the organizers comes up and says, Oh, these two people next to you have, uh, already played each other. Do you guys like mind swapping or something? And I sort of look over it and I can see some Necrons and I was like, Oh, that'd be fine. Like it'll be thematic. So that's cool. Uh, yeah. and then, and then I do that and then someone else comes up to the table and takes the Necrons away. And I was like, oh, what am I playing against? And the guy gets out his army, and it's Death Guard. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> this, this might be a bit harder. Um, but I speak to him. Uh, he's a really lovely chap called Alex. Uh, he's like, oh, yeah, I've lost all my games this weekend. I was like, oh, okay. I was like, oh, is he just not a good player? Like, it looks like quite a good list. Mm. So but so it, gave, it filled me with a sense of confidence. Like, if he's lost all his games... I should have this in the bag, right? Like, not, almost not, not almost no matter what, but I was a bit like, I've got to really like muck this up to lose. Uh, which, spoilers, I did. <laughs> um, well, it was just a very difficult game. So he had um, Demon Prince, which can do psychic powers. He had a Psyker. He had a couple of squads of uh, Death Guard. He had a floaty uh, bloat drone thing with the lawnmower. Um, and he had one of the other little ones, the, the Gribbly... Uh, land ones with the multi melter mm-hmm. if you know if you know what i'm on about yeah um oh and a plague burst crawler i remember the name nice. of that one nice. um and basically this was all about holding the middle objective uh that's where you scored your bonus points uh, in addition to your hold one two three and if your warlord survives and is in the middle that scores your bonus points if you kill your opponent's warlord that scores your bonus points that was like the end game objective uh for this one Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think he wins a roll off, gives me first turn, but he's like really well hidden his army. Uh, so I was like, okay, I'm just going to have to like slingshot this up. So I like charge my contemptor up, charge my captain forwards to try and get into his, uh, towards his, where his psyker is and um, where his like a couple of his um, death guard are. And then I hold everything else back to because I'm a bit worried about like what they're going to do and like their shooting output from the the, the vehicles. Um, I managed to get the contemptor to f- hit the lawnmower, get in, completely doesn't do anything. Uh, Captain goes into I think I managed to multi charge the psyker and the the squad, and mm-hmm. I think I, I I elect to go against the uh, psyker because I'm trying to. 
um actually no what i did is i did one of those like objective things beforehand because i wanted to find the relic which i did mm-hmm. do with the captain turn one then turn two i charged him in uh into gotcha. that scream um because i was like i'll get one in the bag another squad next turn will do that and so I, I mentioned to do that twice in the game and even though once again i got tabled i rolled a one so i managed to give my six uh experience points to my captain so that at least did something so Finishing on a high. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll explain more about it at the end. Um, so yeah, uh, Captain uh, goes in, uh, completely doesn't do anything or much against the Psyker. Psyker Psyche managed to make all his invun saves. Um, then the Death Guard uh, guys have like effectively like a giant meat cleaver in all of their squads. Because yeah. I was like, oh yeah, at most here have a, like a power fist type thing, two damage. I can take that on the nose. No, it does D6 damage and does like six wounds to me or five wounds like turn one. So basically I'm on like a couple of wounds left. My Contemptor gets hit back by uh, Lawnmower. That does like 12 attacks and um does like an insane number of wounds so uh, that drops down as well so uh, uh, that's barely alive and then in his turn he does like an insane amount of mortal wounds from psychic powers like his psyche was devastating so Mm. whenever he casts a spell and i assume this is a crusade upgrade every time he does a spell it's like a mortal wound bomb goes off within eight inches and a unit takes like d3 damage so he managed to do that a few times kill my captain do it do it another time kill my contemptor so they're my two heavy hitters and again against death guard they've all got minus one damage so my plasma, I'm not overcharging, doesn't do anything. Uh, my stalker yeah, so that's the aren't really doing malig- anything against them. That's the malignant plague caster or some words to that effect. Yes, and, yeah. Um, I think you have to be within eight of it, though, for that to happen as well. Well, I was, because I, oh, I charged yeah. it in combat, and he was doing the um, oh, spells within combat, and yeah, the contemptor so was pretty it. close by. I can't remember if it... I can't remember, though, if it is... It, it, yeah, so it does... I only thought it did, like, one... I'm going to check its rules. I'm going to check its rules. Well, here's the thing. But it like, could be enhanced by... Crusade yes, exactly. Or, like, it's hard to tell what was... It was hard to tell what was, like, a core rule and what was, like, an upgraded rule. And yeah, I guess that's the nature of Crusade, for, though, isn't it? It's yes. just such a madness. You just have yes, to accept it gets, everything. Yes, it gets to the mad. point where you just sort of just accept what people are saying. Yeah, whatever you say, mate. Yeah, go nuts. Because like, uh, it, it could be at, at this point. Um the uh he was he played it very cautious with his uh demon prince and kept him back for the first few turns because he obviously didn't want to lose him because it was one of the mission objectives once my contemptor and captain was up he started moving him up the board i managed to use um so i've got one of my sergeants he's holding up a psyker's head and every time so as part of the crusade i upgraded it to be stormwrath bolts which represents like the psyker's eye beams coming out a bit like the medusa's head basically but it only works mm. against monsters so this was the first time in the whole of the weekend i could use it i managed to hit him because they're actually upgraded so they hit on twos um as part of their crusade ability uh, it's only minus one damage sorry it's only minus one wounds but he fails with save and then i managed to do five damage on him so i managed to knock a bunch of wounds off of him and then the next turn he actually started to run him back uh to hide but then i told him that actually you only score for your wall of being alive if he's in the central objective so he moved him up to be on the center so i was like oh great maybe i'll get one turn like i'm i'm slowly getting tabled at this point because i'm just losing stuff left right and center yeah, from it's all going all wrong vehicles and his firepower um so i was like maybe i'll get another turn of being able to like uh, shoot him maybe kill his warlord that would be yeah, yeah. saving grace but no because at that point he uh, i think all i've got left of the stalker bolt guys and they get killed off by uh, all his other shooting uh, i think basically the main misplay was i i didn't realize just how good his stuff is in combat in comparison to how bad my stuff is. i also rolled really badly which didn't help um but what i should have done is just hung back more for the first few turns and just shot at him from range even though i'm not doing a huge amount of damage the sort of chip damage would wear away because i sort of said to him afterwards i was like i i I don't believe you lost all your games not in a malicious way i was almost like how did you lose your games yeah yeah. uh and he was like oh well two games i played uh the minus one damage thing was switched off and i was like oh okay and he went up against like a tau army and 
It was either like, maybe it was like an elder, um, no, Admech, I think he said. So he came up against like some shooting armies, basically. So it mm. sounded like he just had some bad matchups. So he had a very good matchup, uh, against me, basically, in that last game. Uh, that ended, uh, it, it looked closer than it was in terms of points. So he got 46 points. I got 36. Uh, but I was totally getting tabled <laughs> in that game. Uh, and in fact, I got tabled. Turn four. Uh, so he had a whole turn of just moving around and doing whatever he wanted. Uh, he really lovely chap, though. Uh, really gorgeous army. Did he uh, have really any nice of the guy. Space Marine heroes, Death Guard, in his army? Um, no, he didn't, I don't think. Don't see that them too often, do you? No, I know um, Nick. Although I suppose, a... would you even recognise them if you saw them? Oh, uh, I think so. Or at least a few of them. Yeah, I think I would because they're pretty unique. And um, so Krieger 40k on Instagram, he's a well-known uh, Def Guard player and I've played him a few times. He's got them all. So I've seen some of them from um, th- from his army. The Plaguecaster the model they've got is fantastic from that Heroes range. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Do you think it was in the plague? No, I think it was just a gen- generic one. I yeah, no, but the Heroes Plaguecaster is pretty fantastic. Hopefully they do a re-release for those when they finally get around to doing the Death Guard rules again because they they were a really nice set. Mm. For what yeah, because they they've obviously done the uh, Space Moon ones and they've redone yeah, the Space, the Space Moon ones. So I wouldn't be surprised if they redo Death Guard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Space Marines have uh, definitely come back around, which has been cool. Um, and yeah, the, uh, the, 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 the Death Guard version was definitely pretty... Uh, pretty great as well so uh, fair enough right okay well so you played five games you had a broadly good time mm. won three games lost two. Oh, and at three. the end uh so about my captain i basically oh, yeah. needed to get hold on 36 experience points i believe it was to level him up to uh heroic i think it was oh hold on i'm looking at one thing um which I almost did uh, in the last game. Uh, oh, no, 31 I needed to get him to. Uh, last game, he got MVP, so he got an extra three. Um, and then he got six for doing the uh, secret agenda thing. Um, and overall, he got 30 experience points by the end of the game. Uh, so he's one shy of becoming heroic, and that was at the point when I was going to make him... Um, uh, give the battle trait honorific of Lord Executioner for uh, being the eighth company. Uh, but he wasn't very good at being a, an executioner because I gave him a task of trying to kill 30 models over the course of the weekend. And I, did, I he killed nine things, which isn't a lot. No. So I feel like he's very much like a cursed character because uh, he always dies. He always dies in a game really early. And mm. that might be because I'm just too aggressive with him, but I just feel like he just doesn't stick around long enough basically and that was even after i gave him like a um he got plus one move plus one toughness from one of the relics he got um five up feel no pain um in the last game and 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 a few other buffs he still couldn't do it basically um but yeah it was it was nice to level them up uh and stuff like that but yeah i think I think five games over the course of a weekend is a really great way of doing Crusade. I think if you're playing one game every week, you would start to forget stuff. But because mm. it's in such a condensed period of time, it like it was always really easy to remember what all my upgrades were because the yeah, yeah. unit only had one or two by my captain. Um, mm. and, and like the battle scars and stuff like that. That was all quite easy to remember. It helped that I'd sort of pre-planned some of the upgrades that I wanted to give them. So I made like a little booklet to track everything. And I'd found a few cool like relics that I'd like to give to my captain. And I would just write them down and I'd just tick them off once I'd like achieved them. So I wasn't having to, between every game, like sort of search around and read everything to work out what I wanted to give them. I'd sort of pre-planned how the crusade worked, which I think helped uh, just generally reduce some of that kind of... um, the paper load of reading and stuff like that that you've got to do with all the different books and stuff like that. Yeah, no, I hear you, mate. Nice, man. Well, there we go. Thank you, Warhammer World, for another cracking event. We look forward to being there again this weekend for Age of Sigma, but it sounds like Phil had a nice time 
doing the Age of Sigma, not the Age of Sigma, the Crusade. Crusade. The yeah, Crusade. No, it was good. It was good. Uh, yeah, I'd recommend it, despite having uh, like some criticism of the narrative uh, and the general game mechanics around the whole tile system. I just yeah. hope they get rid of that and do something else next time, and I think it would be way more yeah. enjoyable just for that alone. Um, so, yeah, I look forward to whatever they do next, if there even will be, because um, who knows if it will stick around to 10th edition, and if they yeah. do another event before that, I don't know, maybe. I'd hope so. We shall see, mate. All right, cool. How we want to do this? Do we want to transition, or do we just want to say that's it? Because I, it's late now, and I'm pretty much done with recording because I have no time to do any more this week. No, oh, do, do you want to do a super quick outro, and let's talk about where you're at with your Age of Sigma army, and then we're wrapping Fine. up. All right, we're just doing that now. Yeah, do a transitional noise. Do I need to do a transitional yeah. noise? Or do you yeah, need go, to on go to somewhere, it. do you? In the magical wibbly world of what we're doing. Fine. All right. Transitional noise. All right. It's a quick outro where we're going to talk about Age of Sigma. What did you want to ask, Phil? Uh, how are you getting on painting your army? So, it is Wednesday night. It is late Wednesday night. I'm behind schedule, as always. Uh, between a combination of just life, work, and all things in between, it's been a real struggle to stay on top of everything. I put real good work over the Christmas holidays into my Moor Crusher. I was really happy with how that turned out. Um, and now it's transitioning into painting... The Little Griblies, which in this case is nine Gore Grunters, which are the boar boy pig unit of um, the uh, of the Iron Jaws. I have, as of this moment of t- in time, painted them all to a tabletop standard in so much as there is undeniably paint on them uh, and it is in all of the right places. It's just not necessarily painted to a particularly high standard but i think we all knew that it was improbable that i was going to get there for everything i'm very happy that i've got a well-painted moor crusher and i think that the gore grunters will be to a good standard just because the gore grunters are such a kind of detail rich and densely populated figure that i think as long as i can do some last little details on them um tomorrow and uh friday where i can find the time uh i think i think this will be okay um there is an argument in terms of you know when we're going to go up, up to one one on friday i'm not sure whether i'm likely to go up early or late now there's a good chance that i might just stay and paint until I get to a place that I'm kind of okay with it and then leave. So I might sort of go up late-ish on Friday, spend the time at home just doing the last little things on okay. before leaving. Um, Have you got we'll a lot to do? Goes. I thought it was just basing that you wanted it's, to do. It's mostly just basing, yeah. So I've got, I, I think I'll get it done tomorrow night. Um, so I think we should be fine. Obviously, people will see photos and results as we start to post it over the weekend so if people are super interested they can see how i got on um so yeah look i think you know at the end of the day it's been a really exciting project i'm not nearly confident enough in the rules but i don't think that matters <laughs> no. i mean i i've literally not played a game at all yet yeah uh, or, yeah. or even a practice game so i think have you even yeah, read I the did. rules Oh yeah, I've read the rules um, a couple of times now. I probably need to reread them because the last week or so I've been focused on uh, this crusade stuff. So mm-hmm. I've d- re- just had a quick reread of the general army-wide mechanics of yeah. the Night Haunt. Oh my god, there's so many stuff. It's like uh, so six is to hit auto wound like guard, um, but then you can do a special command uh, discorporate. So uh, your six up ward save becomes a five up for that. Uh, they, they, they've got fly they can fall back and charge like white skulls so there's loads of mechanics that I'm sort of used to across my pre-existing 40k armies mm. uh, but there's just a load of like more rules and there's a couple more I can't even remember off the top of my head 
Yeah, I, so I, honestly... I, I, I need to reread that bit. Probably need to reread the core rules. I'm hoping to go up a bit earlier with Tim on Friday so we can actually get practice game in. Um, so I've played a couple of practice games with Tim and I've played a few practice games with Richie. And I think the problem is, though, as well, as we're doing these games and actually neither of us are... Like we need we need someone who actually plays this game to go through it with us, not yes. just us playing each other. Because yeah. a lot of the time we just default to kind of forty k mechanics. It was only like by like game three that I remembered that they have a totally different sequence when it comes to combat and that charging is meaningless in that game and the way that yeah because like, charges don't get struck first like they do yeah. in forty k. But objectives yeah. uh, or as a bigger uh, yeah. combat or as bigger like engagement range and stuff so there's lots of there's a lot more nuance and yeah i think the bit i find most confusing is like at the beginning of each battle round you both can do like heroic actions i think it is yes but then during your turn you can do like commands which are heroic actions they're slightly different than those but they or at least use... I think you're correct, rather, I should it, say. I don't it's know it's sure. something like that, yeah. Because effectively, stratagems are inbuilt onto the data sheets or battle yeah. things, whatever they're called. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of things that are familiar but different. And I think that's the bit. Like I said, I think actually playing games, if we get some nice opponents that basically we say, we don't really know how to play this game, we'll happily sort of show us the way and and show us the ropes and go this is the correct order of things that will make things a lot easier because uh, I mean, obviously I, mean, I think we're going to be hanging around at the bottom tables having lost the majority of our games I think yeah yeah I think that's basically going to be the way that it's going to go for us but you know I'm happy with that reality and I think here's the thing you know we'll play some games we'll figure it out and by the time we've had four or five games we'll we'll know the system and I think we'll be in a better place for future events um, yes yeah yeah, where yeah exactly you know, we can we can build on it and, and, and grow it and play more of it as a group. I think, you know, I I genuinely think that I genuinely think that the games I've played so far have been really fun. I like a lot of Age of Sigmar's mechanics. I say it again, Age of Sigmar is the ultimate expression of the core games workshop gameplay mechanics that is the current Age of Sigmar forty K system. Um, I think Age of Sigma benefits from the fact that it doesn't hold on to these historic um, ideologies around what sort of stats and what sort of profiles that you need to give things. We've already had this conversation in the last podcast to some extent, so we don't need to repeat it now. But I think definitely Age of Sigma makes more sense when you look at the data sheets and how things work. And again, yeah, as I've said many, many times... I really like the fact that a weapon has a role to hit and a role to wound because that does a really good job of expressing the nuance of the weapon on a more consistent basis. It's like, oh, this thing hits on twos, but it doesn't do very much damage and it doesn't wound very well. Oh, okay, hits on twos and wounds on fours and does one damage. Oh, okay, get it. Or this one hits on threes, wounds on threes, does two damage, but it's like super elite. Like this is a really powerful weapon because it, it, it's got good odds of hitting and wounding. Very rarely do you ever see anything be 2-2. Two, two. Um, and it's funny, you know, because, I mean, obviously, we've been talking a lot about how Horace Heresy lately. I mean, Big Phil from uh, Rapid Fire Wargaming, not that that's really a thing anymore, he, he went over to Gibraltar and took part in the Horace Heresy No Retreat, and he's buzzing about that at the moment and getting excited about well, that system. Well, I would be too if I won every trophy known to mankind <laughs> at that event. He did very well. So, one, congratulations, he won the event. He's a charming uh, boy. Isn't he it? also yeah. won, um, I think, like the f- favourite player, favourite yeah. army. Best human being and award. Because, and he also won the coveted Trident Award. So that's you can only do that if you've won the SN Award three times, uh, not in a row, but three times over overall uh which is voted for by the uh, sn team so some of the regular 40k ones he's won that before where i've been to uh so obviously he won it this time and because he's won it three times he won the trident award which is like super exclusive award so he's won basically everything at that event i mean everyone else might as well just go home and not even try anymore because that's an impressive feat basically he's just a great human being though that's the thing and oh for I, sure you know i say yeah. that with I say that with absolutely no hyperbole. He's just, you know, like I was talking to him on the phone earlier about it. And, you know, when you're like talking to him, you just sort of feel like, oh, this guy's, he's just lovely, isn't he? He's just, oh, 
Yeah. yeah, he's he's also a painting machine. He can he speed paints oh to a very gosh. high standard. He's basically what done a three thousand point Horus Hosey army in maybe six every week months? for the last four years. Yeah, yeah, for the last four months. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Since Horus, since Hosey's come out, he did a bit beforehand because um, he knew what he was doing. But yeah, yeah. in under a year, he's done over three thousand points, which would take yes. me a lifetime to do. I think he's done it in less than six months. That man, he just smashed it. Oh out. yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it, it's like a new unit a week, as you say, which is yeah. pretty impressive. It was, yeah, it's incredible. Anyway, I divulge, but the thing was, is that we were talking about it, and it was actually funny because you know we were talking about some of the systems in it and um, bits and pieces. Um, but it occurred to me during those conversations, I was like, well, actually, in the confines of the way forty k plays at the moment, it's like everything in the game now has ballistic skill ten. And that's to my point of what you were talking about earlier with the lethality of the game. I actually think one of the biggest mistakes that their limited D6 system creates is that because they have so much stuff hitting on twos with rerolls, like yes. very readily. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. So against that Death Guard player, he was, I think, hitting on twos quite often and yeah. re-rolling because it was a plague weapon or maybe that was wounds yeah, yeah that's the wound, uh, wounds yeah, yeah. Uh, but everything's plague weapon so it's hitting on twos re-rolling ones so it's like yeah. okay oh it but all goes the, through but and but that's, that's the like, thing with like the old systems is is like genuinely the only stuff that could do that is ballistic skill 10 weapons or a ballistic skill f- sorry a ballistic skill 10 character or a Ballistic Skill 5 character with a master crafted weapon. Yes, because like, I. what's interesting is, I guess, by having a, a 1 to 10 stat, you are effectively doing a D10 system, but you then boil it down to a D6 system. Yeah, you um, interpret it. In terms of your D6, dice rolls, yeah. but obviously that requires quite often tables and stuff, which no one really likes. The, the Age of Sigma, what's so great about it is, as you said, it's been designed from the ground up for a new system and a new way of playing, mm, which is mm. why it works so well. Whereas I think 40K is somewhat let down because it's trying to do that, but still holding on to some of the older like mechanics or some of the stats, as we're saying, they're wedded to, you know, space means having a free up save and, you know, movement of six, because that's how it's always been and would, you know, be a hard pill to swallow for people to change those elements. Uh, yeah. Whereas Age of Sigma, they literally tore it all down and gave us all new stats, uh, yeah. all, all, all new way, ways of playing. I personally don't like the wound roll. I get it uh, because it just keeps things simpler, but I like the nuance of strength versus toughness. So it's like, yeah, you've got a good weapon that's, you know, you're strong. The weapon makes you stronger, but you're up against something even tougher than that so therefore it's still harder to to wound so i do like that the 40k stuff is uh proportionate to what you're fighting against and i that's what i liked about the old weapon skill uh stat line it was weapon skill versus weapon skill and that determines see, how I, good you you were at hitting i'd agree with that statement but up until a limit in the sense that again toughness a in the old 40k slash Horus Heresy systems feels very significant because if you're tough to say you couldn't be wounded by a strength four weapon, right? And and that was like an interesting mechanic in and of itself. Um, and what I will say about that is is that like tough to say felt really significant and it was hard, like literally if you were strength five and you shot tough to say you were wounding it on five, uh, on sixes. If you were strength um, if you were strength uh, six and you were shooting at toughness eight, you wounded it on um, sixes. If you were strength seven and you were shooting at that, then you wounded it on fives. And then if you were strength eight, you wounded it on fours. And that's the thing. Like, I think that's one of the crazy things with it now is like literally like the, the, the and also the, the mass abundance of high strength weapons. It just, it just seems to create a system where, and this is talking to the lethality you were talking about earlier, where the whole game is just a series of two pluses follow two pluses. I, I honestly, so often in the game, I'm just literally going twos follows twos with re rolls all day long. Oh, it's like I mean, I, 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 I'm clearly playing the wrong armies because that never happens to me. Really, you well, most in it's situations where that's freeze. Quite often, it's freeze by freeze or freeze by fours or or against death guard hitting on freeze, wounding on fives. You're like. Oh. Yeah, That's... but it's so often like uh, I mean, hitting on twos is pretty common. 
because it doesn't take much to, to end up in that situation. Hit True. On twos when my captain rolls. was going into combat, he was hitting on twos, wounding on twos quite a lot. Yeah. Um, because of, uh, by the end of the game, he was strength nine on the charge because uh, <laughs> he was souped up to the nines, um, yeah. but then still couldn't kill anything. So it's like, what does that mean? Yeah. You know? But the point is, though, is like the thing I like about AOS at the moment is I like how they express that stuff. I like how the leadership stuff works. I like the, yeah, I like the way that stuff kind of runs. Um, so I'm interested to play the game. I'm interested to see where it goes. I'm very excited to see how we get on. Um, I'm really excited to meet the other players and 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 be part of that AOS crowd. I can't lie. see what it's I'm, all about. Yeah, yeah, I can't lie. I've been watching a lot of Honest War Gamer stuff at the moment and. Again, I don't want to sound like an honest war, war game of fanboy all the time, but I think Rob does a really good job. And I tell you what, one of the things I really like about what Rob does is that he's just sort of really great at celebrating players and celebrating the community. And I think that's one of the things that maybe I always wish that Rob was more active in the 40k community. Like I feel like an advocate like that, that was more focused on highlighting players and talking more. And maybe that exists somewhere. Maybe, maybe the 40k stat center podcast thing that, used to be a thing or may still be a thing maybe they oh, do yeah, that. that maybe that champion still that stuff is going but uh yeah I, I sort of switched off of the um frontline gaming stuff once uh the main organizer was no longer doing it i really enjoyed their like weekend yeah i used to like shows the and stuff, that was stuff great. yeah that's the thing though isn't it right like genuinely i think Maybe the stat center guys are doing it. Like, is there anyone out there at the moment doing actual really good weekly regular coverage of the 40k scene? Like, good coverage. Because, like, most of the competitive focused channels just seem to be very focused on themselves, as it were. Which is fine. I understand that's your business and that's what you're doing. But, like, I don't know. Maybe I'm just not engaging with it enough. But I just felt like... One of the things I used to love about, yeah, the frontline gaming shows of old, those old live stream broadcasts was that it felt like a real kind of, you know, like celebration of the community. I don't, who's doing that anymore? Like, you know. Yeah, I just, so I know people like Auspex Tactics do list analysis. Yeah, but that's that, like... They talk about the top of, you know, what's doing well in the tournament scene, but that's not really celebrating the player and it's more yeah. about the list and just going through it. Yeah, because um, Rob does Not really in the same way that... Of, yeah, Rob does a really good job of breaking down like the tournaments, talking about the players that are doing well, being and sort able of explaining to speak why about it's them doing well, people, and yeah. yes, yeah. so very good at um, sort of demystifying and uh, bringing it back down to like a, an understandable language that if you're not super competitive, you can understand what the yeah, game's yeah. about. So it's he- really accessible. Yeah, respect. he's been a great resource. That Honest War Gamer has been an incredible resource for me over the last few months of getting into this game of Age of Sigma. So, I mean, fair play to him and fair play to, to to that community. And I don't know, I'm excited, man. I'm excited to see what Age of Sigma is like and to look at those comparisons and to see what a weekend of Age of Sigma gaming is like and how pumped up I'm going to feel at the end of it, regardless of what happens. Like, I would love to come away from this weekend going, I love this game. I want to expand my army. I want to do more. Like, this is really exciting. Like, God, I'd love that. I'd love that. Because the problem is with, like, 40K at the moment, and again, I appreciate I sound like a bitter old man yelling at clouds again. But the problem is every time I go to a 40K event, I just come away going, ugh, this thing. It's like, it's sort of like... You know, I did an RTT uh, in Bournemouth um, over the weekend and that was with the 40k Brawl guys and that was super fun. But like, it it was fun because of the community aspects of it, but like actual games, it was like, oh God. Like, you know, I played game one, I played against um, Custodes um, and the guy I played against wouldn't roll anything less than a five um so i couldn't do anything like Mm. i think out of the many hundreds of saves that he had to roll um against my army i think he failed maybe 10 like it was ridiculous like yeah mad and then game two i played craft world which was hard going because they that that's a really interesting list and i managed to beat that and then game three i ended up against votan and it's all just those flipping berserkers with their thunder hammers. 
and you just can't do anything against no, it. Right. They just run into mm. you and just smash into pieces. And I was like, all right, cool. That's the game. And it's just like, yeah, it's just very, um, I don't know. Like, I think, like, the thing I'm excited about with Age of Sigma is an over, like, less of an emphasis on terrain, less of an emphasis on, um, I don't know, like, that sort of shooting. Where, yeah, shooting. Maybe. Well, some armies can shoot a lot. Mm. I mean, obviously, we're going to enter into a meta where, I say a meta, we're going to enter into an environment where the um, shooting regiment is a thing, and that's going to be really good against the champions because, obviously, there are this, there's this whole mechanic around something or other champions. Oh, the Galatian called? champions. Galatian yeah. champions, yeah. And then there's a natural regiment with, like, snipers that can essentially merc those champions. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. That's going to be good. Me and Phil are teaming up, by the way. I don't know if we said this before, so the actual team lookout. So did we, did we settle on a team name, Phil? Uh, no, I like, what was it? The, um, something like the ghosty orc boys or something. Uh, it's got to be spelt as if an orc has spelt it though. I'll, I'll remind you of my options, Phil, right? You can, uh, we can discuss them and see if you, uh, see if you, see if I can't sell you on any of these. What right? about the spooky boys? How about that? Mate, that's rubbish. There's right. no character to that, right? Okay. So these are my options, right? You ready for these, Phil? Yes. So the first one was Hexley Pig, which was more of a Richie uh, thing because he liked Huxley Pig a lot. And I was like, Hexley Pig. Right. That's a thing. Okay, the next one, The Nightmare Before Breakfast. I quite like that one, actually. The Nightmare Before Breakfast, yeah, because obviously you have, like, bacon for breakfast and... Or pork I sausages. guess so. it makes me think you're more like an ogre tribe because that's, that's what true. they're known that's for true. eating. Um, uh, then I've got, but it with, is pretty good. Then I went with non pork porial. Oh right, I see. Yeah, yeah so like non corporeal but non pork porial. Mm-hmm. And then the uh, the last one is that'll ooh pig. Yeah, should should it not be that'll boo pig? Oh, that could be it. That'll boo Um, big. That'll boo. I quite like that'll boo. (laughs) uh, I think a nightmare before breakfast is. uh, Is that a front runner for you at the moment? We need to have a think about it. We need to come up with. uh, Yeah. I'm giving you four. Well, Hexley Pig is not good. That's just. That was a Richie one. Uh, Not that Richie came up with it, but it was more done. If me and Richie were teaming up and he had a, a, a deaf army and I had uh, my current pig army, he'd be all over that. Uh, and what what still, is he's... Heck, Heck, Huxley Pig? Huxley Pig. It's just a thing Richie says every now and again. He likes to go, what are you going to do, Huxley? You ever heard him say that? I don't think I have. It's a reference to an old show called Huxley Pig. He says um, it a lot when playing games. You'll pick up okay. on it now that I've said it to you. Anyway, okay. um yeah, Nightmare Before Breakfast. I'm kind of it was was one I was really happy with. I just okay, but, but yeah, I just maybe go for that one. Okay, but I keep. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and get you to come around to the night. So, that, that'll boo, that, pig. That'll boo. That, that'll boo, pig. Okay, but well, I mean we can do that one if you want. No, yeah. oh, don't just give up, Phil. But, you know, I'll, like, I'll tell you what. I'll sleep on it, and we'll decide tomorrow. How about that? There you go. There you go. Well, yeah. Those are the ones that I came up with. I actually also like non porporeal as well, though. I <laughs> well, that is quite good. It, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's yeah. Uh, it's very highbrow, you know. Non corporeal is not something that uh, like uh, that uh, you know that, that that comes up all the time. I was I was pretty happy with that. Um, so yeah, there we go. Um, I don't know. Can we do something with sausages? Is there like some sort of dead sausage thing we could do? <sighs> I mean, maybe, or like instead of Ghostbusters, Ghost Porkers. Ghost Pork. I feel like that's some kind <laughs> of uh, potential other thing, Phil. Okay. Um, yeah, well, let's, uh, let's uh, reconvene. I guess in terms of where I'm at with my army, uh, I, I feel like I'm slightly ahead of schedule with one day left to go. Uh, yeah, yeah. They're painted. I'm happy with how they've been they're painted. Just in bits. No, but the riders and the horses are still separate. Um, I've done all the basing detail, which is sort of a bit rushed, but that will be fine. I've got to add magnets to the base. 
um and i've got to yeah attach the riders to the horses and i've got to i, th- I think what i'm going to do is do goth varnish on everything uh then assemble everything uh then matte varnish afterwards because i think if i'm sticking them together two lots of gloss might be better or i've got to like carefully i've got to work out how to position them all and the contact points of how to glue it together and if i need to just use super glue or if i'm going to use plastic glue that's the bit i need to experiment around with i suspect once they they've been attached i will just have to they will i imagine they fall over to a stiff breeze basically because these are going to be super delicate so i need to try and make them as robust as possible and always make sure i pick them up from the horse and not the guy because their arms will be uh, super fiddly um but yeah i'm, I'm pretty happy with how they, they've come be very on. be very careful with them when they get anywhere near a terrain oh piece, yeah, right? yeah or like you know sometimes someone will be like oh can i pick it up to have a look at it i think this time i'll just be like please don't like it, yeah, they're, they're, just, they're just they're just they just snag on jumpers uh people you know will walk past them and accidentally like they they, they catch on their clothing as they walk past and stuff they're gonna be yeah very delicate i think so um on the weekend of that rtt i took admec um and the admec army is basically that I, I i was saying in fact to you earlier was an i where it's literally mm. like i may as well have just taken that army out of a case and thrown it at a wall um because just trying to play a game with it i mean at one point i snagged an iron strider on uh, a piece of terrain and the exhaust pipe on the back came off and i was like that's an actual piece of plastic that's actually like connected to it that's not even something that was glued on that was just literally oh. like yeah oh, it's yes. like this is I was like, this is unbelievable. Like, literally, everything came back. I, li- I was just literally like, this is just... Ugh. Anyway. But, uh, yeah, man, look, I'm so excited for it, mate. I think, you know, look, we're not going to have the bestest, bestest painted armies by the standards of Age of Sigma because Age of Sigma is just another level when it comes to, you know, that that, that kind of... Um, yeah, I, I always hear it's always, well, like, the, the community is really good, the painting standards are always really high, um, mm. So it'll be interesting to see what it's like and if it lives up to the hype that I think it will, we man. as 40k I... players are always told about. Um, and Mate, it'll be interesting I've... to see what it's like. Yeah, Wait, this is this is one more step down the down the path to the uh, Napoleonics in the future. That's oh, basically I, I how I look so. at it. Yeah. Well, here's the thing: you can only ever go to your first event for a game system once, and I think yeah. even now, my first time at Warhammer World with uh, Richie at Doubles event. Um, it's still memorable, and we had a great time, and I still remember a couple of those uh, games because they they've just ingrained in my memory. So I'm hoping we'll have as many good moments uh, this time around. And it, it might be that thing of the more times you go to an event, the, the shine comes off of it, and you become eventually a grumpy old man. Uh, but that first one, exactly you're just, just wide-eyed, it and it's really oh, it's so like rubbish. exciting. And the others will just never live up to that first time. So I think this, yeah, I'm hoping it'll be a good one. Indeed, indeed. Um, cool. All right. So there we go. Last little thing to talk about. There's no bottom on the uh, Rogue or Dawn, Phil. How do you feel about that? Um, yeah, I don't like it personally. I know most people are like, oh, you know, but you never look at it. Like, um, why do you care? I mean, it's really yeah. handy in the sense that if you were playing an old system like seventh edition you could easily turn it around and use the compartment to put like cotton wool in and have it as a wreck that's true but normally with those i always popped the turrets off and that's put true. wool that's in true. those bits um I yeah because one was spinning it he goes but you could put like a battery in there and then like you yeah know, but like- i mean it, you could just do that when you're assembling it normally like I, and uh, yeah i've seen people who've already said like they've made or or making uh the bottoms for it and stuff which you know to me you it feels more like that, a, i know I, I was thinking about it but i think everyone else and their dog will, will do it, um, it so i can come one, up so with an interesting your resin one no exactly um yeah because to me it's like i i remember a couple of the aos models like um I think it's one of the Stormcast Eternal Riders. Uh, the belly section of the the lion or whatever it is doesn't exist. It's just hollow. And I remember going, oh, that's really weird. And I think apparently there are some other vehicles that uh, have, have holes in the bottom. But to me, it feels like it's an incomplete model. It's a scale model. I want it to be sort of effectively a replica of what that tank is meant to look like. 
if it was real, just small, right? And actually, I always use the bottom of my tanks. Um, I always paint them for a start, but I always use that as practice for when I'm just starting the model. So any techniques I'm doing or weathering uh, or like, you know, oil paints, I'll always do it on the bottom first because if it's ruined, no one sees it, but I always try and do my best job. And once I've got the flow going and, and got the practice going, okay, I remember how, how this works. I've got the right amount of stippling. I've not got too much paint on my brush or dry brushing for whatever. Um, I'll then go on to the rest of the model. So I always enjoy it as like a little practice area of my tank uh, before going on to the rest. So not having that I, actually hinders how I paint um, the model. If you don't care about it, like, you know, that's good, good for you. But don't also get annoyed at other people for having feelings that aren't that. Fair. Um, yeah, no, fair enough, mate. And then it looks like Duncan Rhodes is making another pile of money with his wave two of paints. Have you bought into that? You're doing that Kickstarter? Uh, no. Um, did you I've even got, know that was a thing? Uh, I did. I, I saw that it was coming soon. I didn't realise it had launched just yet. Uh, I mean, good for him. Um, hopefully he makes loads of money. Oh no, I've still got the Games Workshop stuff. I've got tons of Games Workshop stuff, so I'll, I'll just keep using that to probably the day I die. The day I die. You say that as if you don't think it's too far away. Exactly. Well, I'm, I'm gonna, yeah, unless I want to go into Napoleonics and like use lead based paint or something and lick it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's possible. I'm very happy for, I mean, that's the thing. I don't know Duncan, obviously. I mean, who really does? But, uh, you know, it's always that thing, isn't it? It's an interesting uh, illustration of what you can achieve when you get, like, a really interesting opportunity with a well-established business and how you can then take that and turn it into, you know, something altogether more uh, more profitable, I suppose. I dare say he's making a bit more than he used to be when he was... uh, Working at, uh, at GW, but no, yeah, fair play to I him. I mean, so. I, yeah. I've not used any of the two thin coats, but I'm just, uh, I'm always intrigued by the, uh, by the appeal of it. But, um, yeah, but fair play. And then, yeah, LVO this weekend. So that's a crazy one. Oh, yeah. Um, and then Games Workshop will be doing their, um, reveals. In fact, they're doing it Friday morning. So we can check mm. it out before we go up to Warhammer World. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, so we'll give that a go, see how that's gone on. And, um, yeah, we'll give a, give you our thoughts on the next one. It just feels like there's a lot going on again already. I think the LVO actually creates an interesting time. Obviously, 10th edition's around the corner. Yeah, it's exciting. So, yeah, all right, wicked. Well, look, anyway, that's us done. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. At some point, we'll get around to doing that thing we said we might be doing at the start, which is that whole how we get on with it. I mean... No, no, no. The um, is forty k. The oh, sorry, is Games Workshop the best it's been, or the worst, or Forge World, or something. Oh like yes, uh, that'll be a topic for another time then. Yeah. Another time now, yeah, because yeah. we ran out of time. But um, is that who would have thought that I can rabbit on about my crusades? Who would have guessed? I mean, I have my suspicions, but uh, it's, uh, filibuster Phil should be my name. That's it, mate. That's how it is. Goodbye, everyone. Take care. Goodbye. They love the laughter and they love the living, the moments. Believing and sharing and caring and giving the moments. They're always happy and always at play. The moments are having fun day after day. The moments. The moments. the laughter and they love the living the moments believing and sharing and caring and giving the moments they're always happy and always at play the moments are having fun day after day